session of this day, of the second day of the forum, we're going to speak about the vision for combating corruption in the Republic of Moldova. And this is a specific phenomenon for this region of Europe. And it's um, affected our country from the first years of independence and how we should fight efficiently this disease, this virus. Is there a cure for this uh, phenomenon? Can we um, immunize an entire society against the corruption? What have we learned? If we learned anything from previous efforts to fight corruption, both in the Republic of Moldova and other regions in other countries in the regions. We will discuss about all of these uh, topics in this uh, first session, and I have several guests for this panel discussion. First, I would like to invite Madam Olesia Stamati, the Chair of Legal Committee of the Parliament. Madam Stamati, please take the floor. Next is the ad interim uh, general prosecutor, Mr. Dumitru Robo. Mr. Robo, you can take your seat. Next speaker is the former general prosecutor of Ukraine, Mr. Ruslan Kyaboshapka. Good morning, sir. Next is the senior justice advisor uh, from INL, U.S. Embassy to Moldova, Mr. Kenin Leningen. Kevin Leningen. Welcome, sir. The ex-chair of the Regional Anti-Corruption Initiative, Mr. Davor Dubravica, who is connecting with us through teleconference. Welcome, sir. And the executive director of the Legal Resources Center from Moldova, Mr. Vladislav Gribincha. The perception over the corruption phenomenon in Moldova is very important because um, depending on the perception of the society, you can understand how serious the situation is in the country. And before we launch the discussions in this uh, third panel, I would like to invite you to watch a Vox Populi segment prepared by our colleagues from Europa Libera. What do you think? about the corruption in Moldova. Well, I think corruption will never be solved. Actually, the first point, people are very greedy and people who have things want to have more. Well, we have to think about how to build our future. I have no idea how to fight corruption. I think fighting corruption starts should start with the smallest uh, individual. In my case, from myself, me, I should not bribe anyone and I should not accept bribes. Well, there are many cases when you need a document and you are requested money you have to pay because they start telling you why did you not call in advance why did you not make an appointment so you have to pay we need to have a body who can intervene in small cases like this yes we can fight corruption but I don't think there is enough courage from the uh, state institutions to do as they envision Fighting corruption, I think uh, the fight goes really bad. But, well, then how uh, people, how a state should fight corruption? Well, they should fi find these corrupted people and take them to mining uh, and to have them do uh, manual labor. In my case, I think everybody should start with their own situation, not bribe in the kindergarten schools and so on. Actually, my uh, favorite book is Machiavelli's book, and he was uh, presenting in his book, The Prince, uh, how he eliminated this cancer of corruption. And uh, we have to acknowledge the fact that these systems are interconnected. Um, 
I would like to say that big corruption is hard to fight. Small corruption, it's easier. But which one should be tackled first? I think that the first corruption should be small corruption. After we tackle this, we can go on big corruption. Thank you all. Before we launch the discussions, I would like to um, invite uh, my co our colleague, Victoria Mereuza from the Legal Resources Center to present some statistical data. Victoria will connect with us through Zoom. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to see you and I'm happy to join you in the second day of this forum. I would like to come with some statistical data which can be interesting to be seen, heard and discussed potentially. First of all, I would like to start with the opinion poll barometer. In in 2020, the citizens of Moldova had a chance to uh, enumerate the top three problems that, of our country. And we can see in this uh, table, the first problem mentioned is we need, they see the problem of the living conditions, second, developing the country, and the third, fighting corruption. Basically, 52% of the population voted for this first issue. It's, we're talking about the low living condition. And this is a pretty big percentage for such a small country like Moldova. These data prove once again that the expectations of the citizens are very high for the uh, current government. They want to see quick uh, measures, quick solutions to improve the li living conditions. From the public opinion, we go to the specialists from the justice sector. In another survey we organized in 2020 f among judges, lawyers and um, prosecutors, they were asked about uh, the evolution of corruption from 2011 until the present. We see very different opinion. We see two majority opinion and the two replies contradict each other. A part of the specialists considered the fact that corruption did not decrease in the past 10 years. The other side considers that it's equally the same. And these opposing opinion prove the fact there's no general consolidated opinion regarding the evolution of corruption among the specialists in the sector. And if I can go forward, I would like to say that this is confirmed by the corruption index. We can see the, green, the blue line which represent the situation of Moldova. The evolution of corruption did not bounce very much or move very much. Only in 2021, this in the indicator decreased a little bit. But if we can compare Moldova with another country like Denmark, you can see the numbers uh, in the orange line. We can see that there is a big difference. And in the last 10 years, in the corruption indicators, Moldova seems to remain at a pretty low level. Thank you so much for your attention. This is all from my side. I wish you an interesting discussion and a interesting debate on the topic. Thank you so much, Victoria, for your intervention and for the important data presented. Now I would like to launch the discussions of this panel. First, I would like to give the floor to Madam Olesia Stamati, the chair of the Legal Committee of the Parliament. I would like to ask Madam Stamati to let us know more about the main path to reform and to combat corruptions in Moldova. And of course, you are allocated 10 minutes. I would like very much to take some questions from the audience. Uh, I encourage the public to ask their questions via Zoom or social networks. That being said, Madam Stamati, you have the floor. Good morning, everyone, dear guests, dear colleagues. Yes, I am here and we arrived in the government with a strong mandate allocated or given to us by the citizens in order to combat corruption. And if you will notice the activities that we've done in the first months of government, these activities were targeting, targeting this phenomenon. 
uh, when we amended the legislation in a way that we can ensure a integer climate for the public institutions to do their job and we're making all the necessary efforts to uh, reform the justice sector and to combat corruption it's interesting that my intervention at today's forum comes after the uh, presentation in Parliament of the activity of the anti-corruption uh, uh, prosecutor and as you know we started our activity with some legislative amendments to give more power to the anti-corruption institutions we created tools to assess the leadership of these institutions as well and more specific I'm speaking about some provisions which are assessing the activity of the general prosecutor of the anti-corruption and at the agency for a national agency for integrity so these provisions are not seen as a limitation of independence of these uh, actors but looking at the trust level in justice and we see that these levels are not growing this means that the citizens continue to uh, not trust this sector and uh, at the same time we keep paying the wages of these um, prosecutors and judges even though with the, there is a lack of trust so we are convinced that this state of affairs cannot continue and the independence of justice must go hand in hand with the responsibility and accountability of this sector in front of the law and in front of the citizens therefore the first exercise of assessing the anti-corruption agency proved that this agency had insufficient activity to combat this phenomenon had a very low number of investigations and cases especially if we are talking about uh, uh, public procurement of medicines medical equipment uh, devices especially during the pandemic times we also have the case of the uh, in, uh, ambulances which is uh, delayed we have other important cases which are, are completely delayed and the big number of cases that are ongoing for more than three years uh, raised a lot of concerns to us okay we understand if there are some cases which are complex okay a dozen of cases which need complex investigation but if we look at the numbers and if we see hundreds of cases which are uh, delayed more than three years this are this is a high concern also we noticed that the anti-corruption agency did not require or submit any request for evaluation of assets to the national integrity agency even though the press revealed many cases when uh, judges and prosecutors had unexplained expenses and this case, this was a big disappointment since the director of Chenya was named after a open competition so the director the uh, anti-corruption officers must be accountable for their activities or lack of activities so the formula we also have to assess the formula of com given competences between the national integrity agency and national anti-corruption agency and often times we heard that they uh, usually pass the responsibility from each other when uh, there are cases of high corruption and not enough punishment so we need to reform these institutions and uh, this was one of the recommendations uh, in our report to the government uh, to the Ministry of Justice uh, to reform and to clearly divide the competences of these two agencies and also we need to do more to ensure integrity among the public servants so we've amended the law for the National Integrity Agency with regards to um, describing the assets, including uh, adding the price, the market price of the assets and means of verification. If there are some suspicion of uh, goods be or assets being uh, registered on other person, on a family member, or in the case of very generous donations.
it's very important to understand that all the links of the system must function well and must work together in order to give sustainable results. It's not a secret for anyone that the, if the general prosecutor submits a well-prepared case into court and if there are people paying the judges, there are not going to be any results and vice versa. Therefore, I support the need to extraordinarily vet the uh, workers in the system and this is seen as a tool necessary to create a critical mass of judges, prosecutors, lawyers who are well intended, qualified, they can pass this vetting and they can continue working in the system and support the good results. In this, uh, no doubt, transparency is important. Transparency of the decision making is important. Also, I would like to mention that at parliamentary level, yes, we are in a rush, and this rush is justified, is justified by the expectations of the citizens and by the, um, by the angst of citizens to see some results. But also we care about the transparency by debating uh, the proposals uh, submitted in the parliament. And even if we are in a rush, all these projects of laws are published on the web page of the parliament two weeks in advance, allowing, therefore, to all the interested bodies to consult them, to provide feedback, to provide improvements. Um, in the end, I would like to mention that our firm objective is to uh, ensure a true reform of the justice sector and this reform to be sustainable and irreversible. I hope that the actors from the justice sector understand this as well and they are going to support us, even though they don't completely agree all the time with all the measures we pro propose. But in order to be a successful deep reform, we need the true participation of all the involved actors, all the players in the sector. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Stamatia, for your words. Now I would like to give the floor to Mr. Robo Dumitru, the Ad Interim General Prosecutor. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. Dear guests, dear colleagues, dear audience. To take a factor of the success against corruption means the presence in the law enforcement, law enforcement of champions or drivers for change, of people who put the public interest higher than personal interest and the public support makes them to continuously work in the system and not to work on enrich themselves. And the justice reform should not be the priority of just one institution. This should be the preoccupation of all public bodies, including the ones who have competences for uh, identification, investigation, and uh, uh, sentencing cases of corruption, but also other public institutions who have competences of preventing corruptible behavior and ensuring a integrity climate medium. In this way, having this national cooperation between different institutions is a guarantee of a success in identifying, combating corruption cases. Starting with the objective that each person has involved, each person that gets involved in corruption cases, and I mean here to obtain illegally different assets, to uh, misuse their public position, it was proven that a good tool to combat corruption represents the identification and punishment of persons that became rich in illegal man ma manner. So punishing the corruption cases 
also identification and freezing of uh, goods which were obtained illegally. So having these two cases will make an impact on the society. We can identify a corrupted person by assessing their goods. And the punishment for corruption cases will have a spillover effect in order to prevent new cases if and only if we go further than just identifying the case. We go further to um, seize the goods and uh, confiscate the goods. In Moldova, there are many cases uh, of people becoming rich illegally. And I consider that this tool of seizing the asset must be developed and applied by improving the legal framework, by training the representatives of le legal informant, law informant agencies, by uh, improving the investigation measures and by completing the cases. Although there are many interpretations and comments regarding the activities that are conducted now, currently, by the general prosecutors, by law enforcement, and there are many uh, critics um, to there are many critics towards the measures for anti-corruption, and these measures are seen as um, revenge, um, political fights. And we understand that these measures cannot be uh, cannot be excuse cannot be avoided uh, to receive uh, hybrid attacks in order to distract the public opinion from the true activities that were uh, conducted. In this sense, the general prosecutor's office continues to analyze uh, all the the illegal enrichment cases, no matter the, the subject. We are going to continue the proactive character of our investigative measures, ensuring, of course, the compliance with the law and with the fundamental freedoms of the people. And we're going to continue to cooperate with other public institutions which have some competences to fight con corruption. And we're going to continue to inform the public regarding the successes. More than this, we propose to have a uh, a report on all the completed cases and on cases that are going to be initiated and of course with the sentence for the subjects which were proven to be guilty of corruption and illicit en enrichment including confiscating their uh, illicitly obtained goods and assets thank you so much Thank you as well, Mr. Robo. The next speaker is the former general prosecutor of Ukraine, Mr. Ruslan Raboshapka. I'll, <clears throat> I'll do it without masks as I'm fully vaccinated. And I guess I'm not like uh, breaching the rules regarding the uh, sanitary, sanitary rules regarding the COVID. Um, so I would share with you with some of my experience uh, on the position of the deputy head of the presidential office and the head of the prosecutorial office, prosecutor general in Ukraine. Uh, sometimes I would be um, like more provocative, not so classical as a repre many representatives of uh, international organization. I would prefer perhaps to be more frank and um, to, to say truth rather than to say politically correct issues. Uh, first of all, um, the most important issue is definitely is historical momentum. Uh, it's very rare in the history of our country, say in Ukraine, Moldova, some others, when political will, when you have a unique combination of political will and possibilities and powers to, to make reforms to change the country. Uh, Ukraine uh, had three such kind of chances uh, after Orange Revolution, after Maidan, and when Zelensky, the President Zelensky came into office. And 
each of this time we, we implemented a lot of reforms, but still um, Ukraine has never had such kind, such good opportunity as Moldova have right now. So we wish uh, all the best to Moldovan authorities, to Moldovan citizens in this opportunity to change the country. And we believe that you will succeed in this. Um, then, uh, very important is time. Time is limited, and even now we heard in Vox Populi that people are waiting for reforms, they are waiting for results. And that also occurred, happened in Ukraine when Zelensky became a president. It was a huge demand on reform of criminal justice system, on reform of judiciary, and um, in um, persecuting people who were uh, linked to bribery and to corruption. And now people uh, have a, a huge expectation and a huge demand on justice. So uh, you should rely, you should implement this uh, demand from society. So um, the role of prosecutor's office and Dumitro, I wish you huge success in, in your post. Um, People are waiting for results, so you are responsible for that, and you, you should do that. Um, the next, so you, you have to move quickly. And you know, sometimes mm, I would prefer to make perhaps uh, mistakes, but then to correct these mistakes, but um, to have a lot of discussion and not doing nothing. So doing something is uh, always is better than to have a lot of discussion and to, to waste time. Uh, next, very important, extremely important are people. Uh, you have to find something like, uh, literally speaking, 300 of Spartans, uh, brave, strong, honest and proficient professional people who will sacrifice their time, uh, who will sacrifice perhaps even their life in implementing reform and changing the country. It, this is um, perhaps also one of the most crucial points and it's one of the most complicated in doing reform. Even in Ukraine, it's in a huge country with 40 million of population, it was quite difficult to find, to build a team with uh, such kind of Spartans. Uh, we made a lot of mistakes uh, in these people, but still um, success is not possible without finding such kind of Spartans. Uh, the next is vision of the reform. When we came in, into office, we had already designed uh, the vision of the reform of criminal justice system and how we will fight, fight against corruption. Uh, but still, uh, you will never have uh, like an ideal vision of reform or an ideal concept of reform. So you have just to start, uh, start doing the reform and then life will correct you because uh, no one could, could predict or foresee what will happen in the future. If you start something, then we'll see, you will see how you could do it uh, in a better manner. Uh, what was also very hard for us when the, Zelensky became president, uh, you know, we were in this situation and perhaps Moldova also uh, have the same uh, problem. Uh, many institutions, if not of institutions, were poisoned by corruption and uh, unprofessionalism. And, you know, sometimes uh, we, we even uh, didn't know from, from what to start with these institutions. Um, there were like two ways how to deal with, prob with this problem. One way, one way is to fully establish a new institution from the scratch, like we did with the National Anti-Corruption Bureau of Ukraine which is extremely positive uh, example. This agency created from the, various, uh, from, from the zero, they had an opportunity to select uh, an independent and very strong head of the agency, Artem Sitnik, as I know he will be speaking today. And he managed to create a strong and competent and independent anti-corruption authority, which delivers results. Other way is to reset the agency or to reset the, the, full, the full system. Uh, as we did with the prosecutorial system in Ukraine, we started with the reform of the prosecutor's office of the prosecutor general. Uh, we re-evaluated or re-testated, vetted the prosecutors of the central office. Uh, and in three months, we dismissed 55% of prosecutors. 
they uh, were not uh, they were not professional or honest. Um, so yeah, you should also um, understand that uh, in situations like in Moldova, like in Ukraine, sometimes you should be um, as much radical as you as you can. And uh, as I mentioned, a lot of agencies, or perhaps all of the agencies, are poisoned uh, with the corruption or targeted with the corruption. And uh, sometimes there is no any um, way how to deal with uh, with such kind of problems, other than to, to fully uh, reset the agency or even to to dissolve this, the agency and to create a new one. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Kevin Lanigan, Senior Just Advisor, International Bureau for Criminal Justice, U.S. Embassy to Moldova. Uh, Mr. Lanigan, please. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, both here and online, Buna Ziwa Tutor. I'm very pleased uh, to be here this morning on behalf of the U.S. Embassy. The two days of this forum are long and full, but justice and anti-corruption reform are top priorities and deserve and require this time and attention. All of the inputs and contributions today and in the future from forum speakers and panelists um, and the many more participating remotely will be important to inform the fair and intelligent assessment of the most critical issues in this area and the development of responsible and responsive interventions. So why is anti-corruption a top priority? Well, corruption is a phenomenon which is difficult to tackle and at the same time is a problem we cannot afford to ignore. Research has shown how severely corruption can affect the economy and society at large. You heard yesterday from the Deputy Assistant Administrator of USAID, um, and he explained that in June of this year, President Biden formally established the fight against corruption as a core United States national security interest. Uh, President Biden wrote that corruption corrodes public trust, hobbles effective governance, distorts markets and equitable access to services, undercuts development efforts, contributes to national fragility, um, extremism, um, and migration, as we've seen uh, here in Moldova, and provides authoritarian leaders a means to undermine democracies worldwide. President Biden went on to say, when leaders steal from their nation's citizens or oligarchs flout the rule of law, economic growth slows, inequality widens, and trust in government plummets. For these reasons, the US government is committed to leading and supporting efforts, including here in Moldova, to promote good governance, bring, transpa bring, bring transparency to financial systems, prevent and combat corruption, and make it increasingly difficult for corrupt actors to shield their activities. We are here, of course, in this forum to talk about combating corruption in Moldova, but the scourge of corruption is not limited to Moldova. We have our own experience of this problem in the United States. There, both federal and state agencies and task force are fighting corruption on nearly a daily basis. And several years ago, the European Commission estimated that 120 billion euros are lost each year to corruption in the 27 member states of the EU. And three out of four EU citizens see corruption as a major problem in their countries. So we are all in this together. But one advantage to the global nature of the corruption challenge is that there are many best practices demonstrated throughout the world to study and adapt to circumstances and challenges here in Moldova and many international partners like the United States who stand ready to help. The organizers of this forum suggested several specific issues we might address in this panel. I'd like to take note of a couple of them here. First, I'd like to briefly address lessons learned from the past. It should be no surprise that fighting corruption is a priority and it has been a stated priority in Moldova by many governments. There is, however, a long way from declared intentions to concrete results. It is necessary, of course, to establish the legal instruments and agencies 
responsible for both the prevention and the fight against corruption. Moldova actually has traveled a long way down this road, establishing a broad legal and institutional framework for fighting corruption and promoting integrity that theoretically is relatively sound. But in too many instances, the results they deliver have not been satisfactory. Anti-corruption rules that do exist have not been vigorously enforced and officials steering anti-corruption and integrity agencies have themselves had integrity issues in the past. Thus, one does not find many uh, strong examples of systemic corruption problems in Moldova being effectively tackled. It is accordingly necessary now to focus on implementation and, and on concrete and actual actions and outcomes, and not only on further reforms to the anti-corruption laws and agencies, although further reforms are indeed called for. Second, I'd also like to say a few words on the concept of the irreversibility of anti-corruption reform. 25 years ago, World Bank President James Wolfenson spoke of the need to deal with the cancer of corruption. In country after country, he said that it is the people who are demanding action on this issue. They know that corruption diverts resources from the poor to the rich, increases the cost of doing business, dis distorts public expenditures, and deters foreign investment. Corruption is a problem that all countries have to confront. Solutions, however, can only be homegrown. National leaders need to take a stand. Civil society plays a key role as well. All over the world, and in Moldova too, citizens have risen in protest against governments perceived as corrupt. The people of Moldova, in two elections over the past 12 months, have made clear their demand for action. This is a critical development and a critical moment in Moldova's history. The US government is excited to have here in Moldova the opportunity to work with and support national leaders and civil society uh, and an independent media who are taking a stand on corruption. But we should recognize that the fight against corruption, even when institutions operate effectively, will always be a continuing struggle that will have to be pressed forward with determination and perseverance. There is a constituency for effective anti-corruption action. We have seen that here in Moldova. And satisfying this constituency and continuing to build upon it can help secure and sustain the future of the reforms and provide a measure of protection against their being unwound in the future. But it's unrealistic to believe that anti-corruption reforms, even effective reforms, can be made somehow invulnerable uh, to future reversal. Indeed, such a belief could itself breed a dangerous complacency that could set the stage for precisely such a future reversal. And third, I'd like to address briefly the broad topic of this panel, the vision on combating corruption here in Moldova. One criticism that's been made of Wolfenson's corruption as cancer metaphor is its, is its suggestion that corruption is an illness that could be cured or completely eliminated. This is unrealistic. The ultimate vision cannot be that all corruption in a state is eliminated. Continuing corruption challenges throughout the world in states that deal pretty effectively with corruption make this clear. The vision rather must be that there is a comprehensive legal framework and a well-developed set of anti-corruption and integrity institutions staffed by competent professionals who operate honestly and effectively in executing their responsibilities to prevent, investigate, prosecute, and adjudicate corrupt conduct. That persons who nevertheless engage in corrupt acts must face a sufficiently probable risk of detection with exposure to sufficiently severe penalties and punishments so as to act as a real deterrent to corrupt con conduct, and that the fundamental right of all citizens to a fair hearing before an independent and an impartial judge, uninfluenced by money or politics or special interest is honored, and the citizens know it to be. The US government has provided Moldova real tangible support in its fight against corruption. In January, 2020, the State Department publicly designated 
Vladimir Plahotnuk under Section 7031C of the Department of State Appropriations Act because of his involvement in corrupt acts that undermine the rule of law and severely compromise the independence of democratic institutions in Moldova. To date, the US government has provided more than $300 million to support good governance and civil society in Moldova. And the US embassy, including USAID and the INL section with other US government agencies has worked and will continue to work very closely with the Moldovan government and civil society to design and implement effective assistance programming to continue to support the country's justice reform and anti-corruption agenda. This will not be an easy or a brief struggle, and it will be important to take the time and the care necessary to ensure that new initiatives are well-planned, appropriate, and effective. We are with Moldova in this effort. Thank you very much, Mr. Lanigan, for your advice and opinion how to build the rule of law and combat corruption in the Republic of Moldova. The next speaker is David Dobravica, ex-chair regional anti-corruption initiative. He will join us remotely. Hello. Hello. I hope we can hear each other. Yes. Okay. Yes, we're here. Okay, mm -hmm. good. Thank you for inviting me to join to this event. Hello, everybody from Sarajevo. I'm sorry I can't be with you, but luckily we have technologies in these crazy times. It was interesting uh, to listen to other speakers about uh, reforms in Moldova. Just briefly, I was leading the Prevention Anti Corruption Unit in Croatia during the EU negotiation process. For seven years, I was chair of the Southeast Europe Regional Anti-Corruption Organization, and I was anti-corruption expert in a number of countries all around the world. During my career, I've seen many reforms, changes, and many different solutions. I'll briefly focus on the solutions and situation in the Southeast Europe and in Croatia. As you know, Croatia is the last country that joined to the EU. Intensive anti-corruption reform started during a long and hard accession negotiation process. Chapter 23 was the most difficult one for Croatia. The hardest problem were their judiciary, anti-corruption and war crime prosecution. As the EU accession was national priority, we, when I said we, I think uh, on the practitioners and experts who were engaged to find solutions, got full political support to find the anti-corruption solution that will fulfill strict European demands. Even Mr. Ruslan mentioned something about unique opportunity in the moment, yes. So was that political support sincere and committed to real reforms or political support to fight corruption was only because of EU negotiation process? Whatever we use the moment and that short period, we did a lot of changes in the legal and institutional framework. I'll mention just some of them. Criminal legislation was changes, New institutional framework for fight corruption and organized crime was established. It consists of three specialized units in police, state attorney, and in the courts. A number of law enforcement actions followed. Even on the highest level, former prime minister was arrested, ministers, and other high officials too. This established solution are still in place. Croatia doesn't have anti specialized anti-corruption courts like some other countries. It has just in the prevention field, the new legislation on party funding, access to information were adopted, new conflict of interest legislation establishing an independent commission. There were a number of changes to public procurement, anti-corruption program for state-owned companies, and so on. Opposite to the most of the countries in the region, Croatia didn't establish anti-corruption agency. Instead of having one agency, authorities were divided by different state bodies. Croatia joined the EU 2013 without monitoring mechanisms like Romania and Bulgaria. All mentioned solutions are still in place with slight changes and improvements. Also, all the countries in the region did intensive anti corruption reforms too. All conventions are ratified, laws are adopted, institutions are established, and legal flavoring is even more comprehensive than in the all members. 
After all these reforms and years, we can look on the results. As a reference, I'll use the last Eurobarometer survey on anti-corruption for EU countries and Balkan Barometer 221 for six Western Balkan countries. EU citizens were asked, is the corruption widespread problem in your country? The worst result in EU is coming from Croatia, where 97% of citizens think positive. So almost everybody. The best result is from Finland, 22%. Next question is about level of corruption in your country in the past three years. 69% of Croatians thinks it increased. 74% 74, 74 of Croatians thinks that government efforts are ineffective. 59% of West Balkan citizens thinks that government doesn't find corruption effectively. There are more figures in both surveys, but this is enough to see that after years of reform, something is wrong. So, or reforms are bad and ineffective, or citizens don't recognize government's reforms and efforts. There is no magic formula for success, but there are at least some key elements. Good laws, independent institution in which professionals are employed, and which will enforce these laws, political will, free media, active NGOs, and citizens. But do we have all these elements? The adoption of law, however, is only the first step. The second step, systematic application of the laws and the regulations is much more demanding. I've seen many strategies, section plans, laws, never implemented or half implemented. Also seems that the problem is independency of institutions and persons who enforce legal solutions. If you ask West Balkan citizens, institutions are not independent. Almost 80% thinks this. There are numbers of ways how to make independent institutions dependent and weak. Low budget, limited authority, constant changes of laws, elect political depend management, or just by proposed weak management, use control media to attack institutions and their work, and so on. Citizens feel it. Perception of judiciary is horrible. Citizens think that is the one of the most corrupted institutions. There are numbers of reasons it. Some of them are coming from cases where irregularities in judicial procedures and courts were found and in the length of the high level cases. When citizens see the trial in high level cases lasting for six, seven, 10 years, going up, down, going to the constitutional court, then coming back to the first level, citizens don't recognize this. This is not big number of cases, but it's enough to damage the perception of judiciary and then citizens don't recognize judiciary as impartial and fair. We always speak about investigation and criminalization of corruption, but often we forgot one service that under my opinion has very important role too. Citizens see big fishes and big stories on the TV, but in their everyday life, everywhere around, in all aspects, they can see irregularities which should be prevented by state inspectorate, but they are not. One of the most visible things for citizens is urban planning and constructions. You don't need to be expert for urbanism or for corruption to understand that something is wrong. One of this topic today is digitalization. Uh, a lot can be done by digitalization in all sectors. It could be an excellent tool to reduce opportunities for corruption, increase transparency, communications with citizens, and make easier controls, data analysis, and detection of corruption. In the beginning, in the Vox Populi in Moldova, I saw that people talking that you need to pay to get documents. Uh, this can be also resolved by digitalizations. In Croatia, I see very good system for e-citizens, but actually it's not primary anti-corruption tool, but it has anti-corruption effect. Also, electronic consultation in uh, legislation process works well well. From my personal experience, as ordinary citizen, I was personally writing comments to some draft laws and they were accepted by government. Next, for effective anti-corruption fight, we really need active and strong civil society. Unfortunately, after EU accession, civil society in Croatia is weak. The main reason is a lack of funding. Civil society organizations as a EU country, they lost donations. Now funding pro is, is project-based, what is okay for a particular project, but we really need everyday's watchdog, that everyday can react and warn not only project watchdogs. Speaking about media, 62% of the West Balkan cities think that media is not independent of political influence. 
I don't have time to go too deeper in this, but no successful fight against corruption without free and professional media. Social networks and fake news portals can't replace it. It is needless to say that successful anti-corruption work is impossible without political will. Adoption of laws, its implementation, funding, of institutions, we all know it. Uh, here I would mention some interesting phenomena. In both surveys, citizens as most corrupted see political parties and politicians on national or regional level. But there are numbers of examples in our countries that when a voting day comes on national and local level, citizens don't show it on the voting papers. I was wondering why voters are not punishing corruption. There are two possible reasons. One of them is populism. It's growing all around the world. In the Balkan region, populism has face of nationalism. Populism is feeding with enemy. You always need to find enemy and big national and historic moments to speak about, especially in pre-election period. And then elections, they come, some suspicious activity of politicians for voters look less important in compare with big national topics. Other reason can be because many people are depending on the state and local budget. In West of Balkan countries, one third of the people work in the state sector. But even many companies in private sector, I don't consider them as a real private sector. When you look structure on, of their business operation, you can see that 100% of their work is with, only with state and local budgets. They are depending on the budget too. Here we come almost to the half of population working for state or local unit. Economic situation is bad, unemployment is high, and even people are aware of corruption in political structures, they won't do nothing to change it because every change can ruin the establishment, established pyramid of interest and net of privileges, and they can damage to themselves too. One of the ways to prevent it is development of economy and free market. I see a light around the region in the newest and amazing development of companies based on the new technologies. These new guys are working on the whole market. They don't need state budget. They don't depend on the mercy of politicians and their public procurements. State-owned enterprises played an important role in many countries and operate strategic areas, but is often the main prize in elections because state-owned enterprises have money, assets, contracting companies and employment to offer, which is everything needed to gain and maintain power. Politization of SOEs should stop an effective system that will prevent abuses and corruption if SOEs must be established. I list some of the reasons why, under my opinion, pool of results are so bad. After years, I think that we are just in the beginning. There's a lot to be done and not to relax. Bad guys are just replaced with new bad guys. I'll mention a case from Croatia from last week. Ex-Minister of EU Fund and a head of Central Authority for EU projects contracting were arrested. But these people are young. These people were literally in kindergarten 10 years ago when Prime Minister was arrested. So no relax. Fight against corruption is not anymore in focus like it used to be in the, our countries. There are other topics, COVID crisis, migration crisis, internal EU problems. But fight against corruption should not stop with the day of accession. I have feelings that some EU countries today wouldn't pass demands from negotiation process. You must keep core values and find effective mechanism how to stimulate members to progress, not to let them in stagnations. Only in that case, EU member states can be a good example and model for neighbor countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Dubravica. Um, the presentation was very interesting and it was uh, like a cold shower that uh, showed us in a realistic way how complicated it is to fight corruption. And now I'll give the floor to Vladislav Gribinche, Executive Director of Legal Resources Center from Moldova. Esteemed participants, esteemed um, uh, Chair, uh, Prosecutor General, Mr. Leningan, it is a pleasure for me to speak to you today. Now we are speaking about a vision on how to fight corruption in the Republic of Moldova. And I will try to speak about the vision itself. And uh, as we have heard in today's discussion, it 
uh, it seems to be the second most important thing after political will. And it is very difficult to speak after you. That's a disadvantage. But one thing is clear out of everything that you have said, that uh, fighting corruption is not limited per se to fighting corruption, but it entails a change in the governance of a country, because corruption is a phenomenon that affects all of the sector, and in particular the political sector. Several years ago, Ukraine, in, in Ukraine a war started, and this war underlined one thing, at least for me, that for our countries endemic corruption is the main factor that endangers the national security. And if uh, in the Ukrainian uh, army and in the Ukrainian corruption, the corruption wouldn't have been so high. I am sure that at least in some parts, the results of military elements would have been totally different. I reiterate, in my opinion, corruption is the main factor that endangers our statality statehood. And when we speak about fighting corruption, we need to understand clearly what we are speaking about. We are not speaking about eradicating corruption, but about bringing corruption to a level that would not endanger the economic development of the country and that would allow curbing any attempts for corruption to become endemic because corruption existed for thousands of years and it will continue to exist what it is important for it not to hinder the development of a country and the welfare and safety of its citizens albert einstein used to say show me the support point and i will overturn the world I would like to say the same thing today. We have to understand the causes, the roots of corruption in Moldova. Corruption is different. The types of corruption is different. But uh, for our region, I think corruption is quite specific. It is not part of our culture. It is not part of our history. It is something relatively new. I'm speaking now about endemic corruption, which is not uh, of uh, it, it does not belong to everybody, but a group of um, people in our society. It's like a uh, inverse pyramid. So when we speak in Moldova about corruption, we cannot say that it is only specific to the justice sector. It is specific to the whole country, and we have to tell it out loud. Political will, we have discussed today, it is very important. I do agree, it's the main ingredient, but it's not self-sufficient. We need other ingredients as well, such as uh, vision, planning, coordination, prioritization, and resources made available. The approach should be comprehensive and long-lasting, sustainable, and it will never end if we want to have a robust state able to fight corruption. I do not want to present a lot of theory about corruption. I will present the areas I would focus on. First, transparency of the governance uh, process, because in uh, foggy waters, big crocodiles are, bo are growing. The more transparency we have, the fewer corruption opportunities. Number two, to limit the discretion of public officials. When a customs official has the right to authorize an import of perishable goods and to decide should it be in three days, one day or three hours to do the customs clearance, 
This is a clear invitation for corruption. We should not have such situations. The third element, dissuasive punishments for corruption. We will speak about them in the afternoon, but it is important to focus both on the sanctions applied to the person. This is important, at least for the initial phase of fighting corruption. Number two, interdiction. So if we caught people in corruption acts, they need to understand that they leave, that they lo lose everything. I mean, the possibility to work in the public service. And also, the punishment should be dissuasive enough in the um, uh, financial or material terms. I mean, the punishment should not be so little that after you pay it, you'll have lots of wealth to continue your life. And institutions is the third element. And when I say institution, I refer to the investigation body that should be independent, should have resources and professionals. Where we can find professionals? Well, that's a very complicated uh, question. As um, Maria Mashapka said, it's not uh, easy in a society where we had for 30 years endemic corruption to find 50 people courageous enough to fight the grand corruption, not the small one. A good leader for the anti-corruption prosecution, organized crime, it would be difficult to find such a person. Can a general reform the Ministry of Defense? That's a question. Can three generals reform the Ministry of Interiors? Also a question that we have to think about. The collaboration with other institutions is also important. We can have one good anti-corruption prosecutor's office, but if this institution will not have good cooperation with the National Integrity Agency, with the fiscal authority to provide the information, if they are not going to synchronize the database, the effect of their activities is going to be very limited. Another aspect is uh, equity of criminal procedures because oftentimes these uh, procedures, the criminal proceedings in court do not end with a sentence. Okay, we have a body who does good investigation, but if these proof, if these evidences don't uh, ultimately receive a conviction, then it doesn't matter. So we need to have a, a connection between these two. Public control is another aspect which was mentioned. Mr. Dubravik said to several times a civil society which is vibrant needs to uh, to keep an eye on the authorities and we also need an independent press and we also need investigative journalists who can always dig up illegal or immoral activities and I can ensure you no public institution has the necessary resources to do these investigations but any uh, information any hint of investigation is needed and next, looking at the Ukrainian uh, Ukra Ukrainian experience, we understand that we cannot do anything without external support. We need the support of development uh, partners in order to create a commission of uh, uh, drivers to change. Therefore, I look at Kevin. I would like to look at some people from the European Union, but they're not here today. But otherwise, I would look into their eyes as well, because they have a role and they uh, to play and the authorities must reach out to them of course that we speak about these aspects and other elements which we don't mention but it's important to prioritize we will not manage to do everything in this time that we have so we have to prioritize so this is my these are my thoughts the first should be reform of justice sector this should be connected with the anti-corruption measures political corruption is something that we need to understand and tackle. The big corruption is connected to the political factors. And when we speak about po uh, political corruption, I'm speaking about two things. First, funding political parties, and second, independent media, or to be more clear, um, politically affiliated media companies. So if you t tackle these two elements, the political corruption will decrease. Another aspect are public funds and public procurement.
you need to increase transparency within these procedures so that it's extremely hard to cheat in public procurement processes. Next is the digitalization mentioned by Mr. Ryabor Shapka as well. Uh, people will have more access and it will be easier to uh, click on something and obtain a document instead of going and uh, uh, taking a line and taking a, a, a a queue and obtaining a document. I'm very happy to have a minister who is for digitalization, who is supporting these efforts. Another uh, element is facilitating access to public, public interest information. Yes, we always say we have journalists, but if the journalists are not allowed to have access to publicly available data, then it doesn't make any point. And next is uh, the National Investigative Agency, sorry, National Integrity Agency must be supported as well. They, we have to work in parallel, uh, National Anti-Corruption Agency and, and Integrity Agency so that they work going work hand in hand. We also need a good investigation division at the Ministry of Finances who can analyze the data, who can monitor, who can check the data from the investigations of anti-corruption prosecutors. And another uh, point which I would like to close with, a, one of my professors said back in the day that justice reform and combating corruption is not for people uh, which are short-sighted because this is a long road, a complicated problem which needs a long-term vision and effort and we need to start with the causes of this phenomenon, not with the effects. And the cause of the high corruption is the political arena and their interest and small corruption cases are just the consequences of the high corruption and ignoring the public interest. I apologize for taking longer than I should, but I wanted to finish my thoughts. Thank you so much, Mr. Gribinch. I would like to add to what you said as an investigative journalist. I would like like to say that it's important that we need to um, speak more about uh, tick companies which are uh, in a quote uh, quotation partnership with the state uh, agencies but at the same time they suck the public funds so we need to reveal these cases to the society now i would like to speak uh, to read some questions from the online i wrote down 20 questions and thank god we have time i hope you can reply to all of them but priority will be given to the questions from our viewers so we encourage the audience to ask and write their questions on Zoom or on Facebook or on YouTube, YouTube or any other social media. And my colleagues will uh, pass on the questions to me. So I have a question from Zoom. Corruption is a the most serious problem and this justifies the need for a reform. And my question is, how can we do at the same time a justice reform and to change the traditional habits of Moldovans? I don't know, maybe you have a reaction. So, Madam Stamati, we can start from you since you are, uh, you can refer to the reform. Okay, so if I understood the question, how through the justice reform we can change the habits, the culture, you mean the habit to offer bribe? Yes, we have to admit the fact that corruption is in the mentality of Moldovan people. So let's start with simple citizens. When they have a child going to school, they give some money money to the school, then they go to the doctor, they give some money to the doctor, and from these small cases of corruption, it could arrive to big cases of corruption. So how do we change this mentality? And also, I would like to remind you the data presented by our colleagues from the Legal Resources Center, um, or when we saw the Vox Populi, 
we heard that the corruption is the third uh, most uh, important problem, the second being economic development and the first being the low living conditions. And I think the reason why corruption is the third most uh, important problem is because citizens don't see the direct link between corruption and having a good living condition and economic development. It's obviously the fact that as long as we have this high level of corruption, a endemic, um, a true endemic of corruption, we cannot do economic development, we cannot do investments, we don't have a uh, system which protects the investments, we cannot convince our young people to stay in the country and continue to work in this country. Uh, they are often time uh, more, uh, uh, it's more appealing for them to go abroad and invest there. So they don't see the connection, but it's not their fault for not seeing the direct connection between corruption, the level of corruption and the level of living condition. Because we can debate which one came first, poverty or corruption, or corruption generated poverty or vice versa. We can debate on it, but it's indiscutable that they are connected. And I come back to what Mr. Vladislav Gribincha said earlier, how by combating corruption we can stop these practices. I think that the example has to come top bottom from the leadership, from the political arena. Uh, each politician should prove uh, a uh, um, moral behavior, a integral behavior and a uh, honest desire to combat this phenomenon and second, uh, efficient sanctioning. When when we, when citizens are going to see that for corruption acts there is a punishment, a sanction, believe me that the temptation to do other corruption acts will slowly disappear. The anti-corruption uh, uh, agency evaluation report showed that from all the cases arriving at their office, 95% of the cases that are uh, ending up in sentencing, it's just a sanction, a penalty. And we come back to the interest or lack of interest to avoid the corruption acts. So if one individual has some gains, I would say many more gains from some corruption act, a huge amount more than that small penalty uh, commission that he has to pay as a sanction, of course he will not be uh, deter deferred, deterred from doing that corruption. Okay, I have a whole follow-up regarding uh, the proportion between the crime and punishment. I would say that we have serious punishments in the law, but it depends on the judges to uh, to give a sentence with a uh, severe punishment. What do you think, um, Madam Stamati? And after that, we can give the floor to Mr. Gribincha. What can you tell us about the discretion of the judges in applying the punishment? Okay, there are several factors here. It's not only the discretion of the judges. Sometimes uh, the judges uh, say that the criminal code needs to be updated because it has uh, uh, old uh, punishments and uh, sanctions and we're going to work on that. But if to speak about the discretion of the judges, we first have to talk about the, the uh, type of uh, crime and which uh, paragraph, which point from the criminal code is uh, uh, categorized under because it matters which article is invoked and the decision of the judge needs to be based on these points and articles. And But I think that other elements are important like the quality of evidences, the mechanisms 
for not allowing the judge to have a high discretion margin, which is again a potential corruption source. Because if we leave a high level of discretion uh, to the judge, then the judge has a whole field for playing. So we need to look on how to uh, limit that level of judge discretion. Yes, Mr. Gribincha, I would like to speak about several points on how to change the traditions, right? I would like to start by saying that traditions are the most difficult to change. But the good thing with Moldova is that we don't have long term traditions. We have constraints that make the people to do this habit. We don't have tr hundreds of year old uh, traditions like Middle East or China um, and, and to have this tradition be a part of life. And I agree with Madam Stamati here. Our own behavior, our own example as e are important. Where the leader is not corrupt, the entire institution is not corrupt. If the leader starts being shady, this spreads out. And second, again, uh, speaking about the danger to lose their goods, to be sanctioned, uh, must be much higher than the uh, gains and not only be included in the legislation but to be applied into practice. Uh, if we do this um, uh, for several years, then it will spill over and will prevent other uh, cases. And I can give you the classical example here by wearing the seat belt. A few years ago, almost no driver was wearing a seat belt in Moldova, and we had a high um, promotion campaign. We had high uh, uh, punishments, and after two, three years, everybody is wearing a seat belt. And I would like to come back again. The sanctions for corruption are pretty low. And the judges have their practice to just give the sanction. And it's not complicated to change this practice. And when we have this question, we should change the practice for whom? Okay, in case you are, you have the subject, a minister, a member of a parliament, a judge. So we have to change the practice. We need to have very clear laws, despite who is under the law, who's falling under that law, MP, prosecutor. We need to make the law very clearly. And also regarding confiscating the goods, the extended confiscation of goods, Sometimes uh, the law is open for interpretation, but we need to make it uh, clear and we need to uniformize the practice of the constitutional court because sometimes they interpret in one way, other times in another way. Because if they're going to be consistent, we're going to understand where the problems in the legislation are. At the moment, it's a chaos. Sometimes they take one decision and justify it in a way, other times they do it differently. And uh, we keep speaking about the change of mentality, but we should give the chance to people, to good people, to live openly on, uh, within their means. If their uh, wages are not enough to cover the essential means, we have to raise the salary so that they can live comfortably because we constrain the people to be corrupted, to choose to be corrupt. For example, I would like to remind you that in Moldova we pay the lowest wages to judges out of the, all the countries in the Council of Europe. And okay, I agree that the level of um, the living conditions are different, the level of expenses are different, but this should make us reflect. Okay, I have a question. Earlier we spoke about who came first, the egg or the chicken, the corruption or the poverty. 
and I would like to ask, okay, the, we had an increase in wages for judges and prosecutors and there were no results. Uh, the judges and prosecutors were asking for better wages, but this led to no results. I have to say one thing, increasing the salary must go hand in hand with all the other elements. Okay, then how do we motivate them to uh, not be corrupt? I would like to say that we need to combine the increasing of wages with the punishments, with the uh, reform. And if you don't combine the increasing of wages with all the other measures, only one thing will happen. The bribes will be higher. That's all. Okay, I understand. I think Mr. Ryaboshapka would like to take the floor. Uh, fully agree with what Vlad has said just. Uh, in Ukraine, we have uh, raised the salaries for judges and for prosecutors. For example, the judge of the first instance uh, has the salary times like 2,000 of euros. So it's not, uh, it's not bad for, for, for countries such as Ukraine. So the salaries in Ukraine sometimes are even equal to those uh, which have uh, judges, for example, in France or judges of European Court of Human Rights, for example, judges of Supreme Courts in Ukraine uh, have uh, salaries something like from eight to ten thousand of dollars. But it doesn't um, prevent uh, it doesn't prevent the, the cases of corruption in judiciary. So I fully agree that it should go uh, hand in hand with very strong uh, sentences policy, anti-corruption policy in country. Uh, regarding the change in the mentality, it's a very long way. Um, what I would uh, suggest here, first of all, there is a very popular assumption that if on the top, uh, if in the government they take the bribes, it means that we also could take bribes. Uh, so we are equal to those to, to those who are in government. So the leadership and the example from government is extremely important. It could just ruin this, uh, destroy this assumption, and then people just could see uh, that if government is honest, then they also should um, should be uh, as honest as, uh, as leadership of the country. But uh, again, it should also go uh, hand in hand with the sentence and with a strong uh, persecution policy. Uh, with this uh, regard, I would also mention that just like um, lost the focus on this, the strong communication strategy from the state. It should exist. Uh, and I would be frank with you, it, with you, it was one of my mistakes on the position of the prosecutor general when did not focus on uh, communication a lot with, with society. We did not explain to society what we what we did in the prosecutor's office. So I would suggest to you to to have um, to have a, a, a communication strategy to communicate a lot with media, with journalists, to organize and off records uh, sessions to explain what the government what government is doing. I definitely know that government in Moldova is doing extremely lot, many, many good things. I definitely know that the prosecutor's office uh, have no good results. But um, I would suggest you to be more open uh, with, with media, perhaps to organize meetings with the so-called public leaders of public opinions and to explain them what you are doing. It means, you know, that the bad guys, they always use controlled media to attack you. And it means that population will have a, a lot of bad information about the government and they don't have enough of good information what, uh, what is government doing. Thank you so much, Mr. Ryaboshapka. I completely agree with what you said. Communication is very important between the state institutions uh, uh, and 
press because we need to know what is happening there, what is being done, because if there's no correct information from the state institution, then the bad boys uh, take this opportunity to spread their opinion, their misinformation. Now I'd like to go to Mr. Robo uh, because he spoke about combating corruption, which cannot be done only through one institution, but there needs to be a cooperation between multiple institutions. And you spoke here about unlawful enrichment. Basically, all the cases that were open for illicit enrichment were never arriving to court. Or if they were arriving into court, the, uh, the court uh, proceedings were taking years and years. And we can even see here uh, the cases of a, uh, uh, of a judge who has an open case for illicit enrichment and there was no sentence. So is there a will in the general prosecutor's office to change this situation? But are you sure that the judicial system, the judges also want to have this uh, change? I am certain that the judges will also have a will. And once the big corrupted people will be investigated and given to the justice, we will have results in the courthouses as well when their cases will be examined and the sentences, sentence will be given. Okay, what if the, what you said doesn't become true? Well, in the courts, we have many judges who are correct, honest, and have integrity. I am certain that the cases for big corruption will be completed with a sentence. Okay, I hope that the spontaneous division of cases will give these cases of uh, big corruption to these honest judges that you mentioned. Uh, and speaking about big corruption, what are you speaking about? What is a big corruption case in your perception as a general prosecutor interim? Big corrupted people. Okay, can you give us more detail? Well, I can say here state uh, officials who have key positions, including politicians, uh, high level officials, this is what I mean when I say big corrupted people. Okay, thank you for the clarification because your predecessor also said he was fighting the big corruption, but he said that he's staying out of pol politics. Do you have the same restraint to uh, investigate uh, big corruption among politicians? I mentioned in my speech as well, we are all equal in front of the law and everyone will be investigated no matter who they are and no matter their position. Thank you so much. If there are another comment from our speakers, if they would like to add comments, okay. If not, I would like to come back to Mr. Ryaboshapka because he was speaking about the 300 Spartans that he needs, that he proposed to find in order to fight the big corruption which bothers uh, the leadership of the state. I would like to ask you, Mr. Ryaboshapka, where did you find the 300 Spartans and where could Moldova find these Spartans? Yeah. <clears throat> it was really the most complicated issue to find those people. Um, what we did in the prosecutor's uh, process, prosecutor general office, we, uh, we are trying to find such kind of people uh, throughout the Ukraine. We um, established a specialized department which um, was responsible for um, grand corruption cases. And we attracted people from, from all the regions, from Zhytomyr, from Mykolaiv, from Odessa prosecutor's office. It was it was difficult to find those people. Uh, there were also even some cases when we asked uh, some guys from Georgia 
Georgian prosecutors also to assist us. So it's not an easy task. Um, perhaps in country which is um, targeted by corruption, a lot of prosecutors also somehow sometimes were connected to corruption cases. But it was an issue. I agree with you. Thank you. Uh, o întrebare venită de la cine care uh, ne urmărește. Vreau doar să amintesc că puteți adresa întrebările și în regim de live, prin video. Thank you very much. Once again, uh, dear uh, audience, uh, you can also address a question if you can use the raising hand option in your Zoom or you can write the question in the chat. We will read it. Okay, we have a question. Combating corruption cannot only limit itself to changing uh, prosecutors and judges. There is a need for cooperation between institutions. Until now, institutions actually are in a competition and they're trying to uh, blame each other. How do we make sure that this, uh, the same institutions who used to blame each other are going to cooperate in the future? Madam Stamati, probably this is a question for you. Thank you so much. On one hand, this is true, somewhat true. This sentence is true because we had a time when these institutions in the past collaborate, collaborated very well, but they did not collaborate for the higher interest of the citizen, but they collaborated for the interests of uh, certain uh, oligarchs. So collaboration is possible. The question is how do we make sure that these institutions do collaborate for the higher interest of the citizens and according to the legislation? On one hand, and we need probably to introduce some additional provisions in the legislation, for example, like we did in the law for the uh, integrity agency. We have consolidated there the aspects for data sharing uh, between the agency for integrity and other state institutions in order for them to do da efficient data verification, data chain, uh, data evaluation. But this is not enough. You can write uh, whatever you want in the law, but as long as this is not applied into practice, it's for nothing. So I think that in the head of these key institutions we need a good leader and I'm speaking about the institutions that are part of this circle of combating corruption not necessarily directly indirectly as well and we can add here the fiscal inspectorate mentioned by Mr. Gribincha or like the border police uh, the customs service uh, all of them are very important in the effort of ensuring a, a integer environment. So we need to have good leaders uh, in these institutions, uh, leaders who share the same vision of combating corruption in the public sector, of creating a uh, rule of law environment, and we need to have leaders who are willing to collaborate with others. And if we don't find these leaders, and if this situation is obvious that the institution uh, or the leader sabotages this cooperation, then we raise the question, why? Why this is happening? Why they're not doing their job? And what is their interest to sabotage this cooperation? And we take the necessary steps. This is it. Um, uh, what about the political decisions? OK, if we don't have cooperation, we need to analyze, first of all, first of all, why? What are their interests? There could be different situations. It could be in political interest, could be another reason. And depending on the situation, we can take a decision. Mr. Garvincha, what is your opinion regarding this topic? I mean, the cooperation between institutions. Well, number one, to have a good cooperation, you need to have good institutions. So it's not enough to have a good manager only. Well, the manager can, but the manager cannot do everything instead of the whole institution because the manager needs to uh, receive uh, information that will be able to analyze. So a person is important, but the team is even more important. 
So to find two or thirty champions, that would be the biggest challenge. That's why I underlined the current government should lead by example. And one of the best example, and I remember here the experience of Denmark, by the way. Denmark has never been uh, has, has not been always one of the non corrupted country worldwide in the 17th 18th century Denmark was uh, uh, very corrupt especially the um, uh, customs office that used to control the entry into the Baltic Sea but after they had a war and they lost it they started to think why they lost the war and the answer was because of corruption and because of the very weak state um, oh, authorities oh, the um, Danish uh, king was the first to introduce uh, merit-based uh, appointment so when we have merit-based appointments not as a favor or appointment of people that are friends to you or you, you know them well so that would be the biggest step forward yes we can find 10 or 20 leaders but what will we do next merit-based approach should be a part of the public service and I've said previously I am not fascinated uh, of the recent uh, trends to remove uh, competitions to employ managers of the agencies that should be independent and I'm telling you frankly if we uh, link uh, the managers to politics in four years the next government will try to change everything and the institutions will be again unarmed to deal with the provocations with the challenges we need to have robust institutions but for that we need to have a merit-based system and good leaders so when we have such institutions we can speak about cooperation if we have a good institution but the others are weak there will be no cooperation let me give you uh, an example. We can have a good general prosecutor and ask for information from the National Anti-Corruption Center, for example, which can give them uh, wrong or weak information. It means that a good prosecutor general will operate on the basis of misleading or inappropriate information, and that would generate mistrust. Also, we have to understand that we do not have competition um, Oh, now we have competition among the institutions that have to fight corruption. But what we need to have is to have cooperation, not a system where we try to blame others for our own errors. If there is an error, if there is a failure, then it's our common failure. So my point is that to have cooperation, we first need to have robust institutions. But uh, in addition to cooperation, we have to think about a vision that should be a common vision for the whole administration both with regards to grand corruption and small-scale corruption because the grand corruption is the reason of small-scale corruption but to identify the grand corruption you should start with the small one because the roots are there the grand corruption uh, oftentimes is visible but to reform institutions you need time political will to reform justice and combat corruption is now in place isn't it risky to start reforming institutions and then uh, uh, when they are almost reformed the political will changes and you start anew because there is um, a clock and the time is running out uh, people have expectations and mr dobrovic spoke about this you have to meet people's expectations they cannot wait forever for justice sector to be reformed because a reform does not bring uh, immediate effects time is needed to fill the uh, outcomes but people uh, are tired of waiting for example we are waiting for so many years already some concrete results with uh, regards to the investigation of the theft of the billion and we don't have them yet so it's a kind of trap for politicians so there is a saying in the Russian uh, I'll try to translate it so whether 
so it can be a horrible uh, end or a never ending horrible situation something like this so we have to choose between them too uh, uh, there will be always risks but risks uh, uh, can be managed wisely in order to mitigate them number two prioritization is also important one does not need four years to reset an institution this can be done in one year and another interesting thing we need to identify these champions and take them out of Moldova for a year or half a year for them to go in Italy France, Germany, for them to see how to work on such cases and then to bring them back to Moldova and appoint them in management positions. But to give them discretion, we should not limit them in the past traditions. This is possible and you don't need four years for that. This was proved by Saakashvili in the first mandate, not in the second, in the first mandate. And we have to learn from the Georgian experience as well. I'd be very curious uh, to find out the opinion of Mr. Dubravika and uh, what should be done in order to ensure a balance between the reform of the institutions and uh, meeting people's expectations. Many speakers were speaking about the uh, situation in judiciary here and uh, you were speaking about uh, increasing of salary and of course uh, it is important but you never can give uh, enough salary somebody to fulfill somebody's greed or in a case where uh, i don't know you can give ten thousand euro salary to the judge but there are opportunities or cases where uh, cases i don't know a few millions of euro worth so there is always always the opportunity of course the judges uh, must have uh, good salaries but it's also not it's not only tool to, to resolve this these things um, an opportunity for corruption also there are a lot of talks about uh, reform of judiciary, but uh, I must say that uh, this is very sensitive thing. And uh, by the fight against corruptions, we should not undermine independence of judiciary because uh, independence of judiciary and is not because of judges. It is because of, of the citizens. A citizen must feel that uh, judges are independent. So to put too strict measures to judges, I heard some things also about the limitation of the, of the punishment. It can also undermine judicial independence. So this is, you must be very careful, I think, with, with these things. And also, I, I couldn't... Uh, be here uh, yesterday to hear what is the direction of the reform of judiciary in Moldova. But also, as I see from agenda, there is also solutions of vetting of judges. Uh, some other countries are doing this. Uh, I'm not sure about results, they are good or not, I'm not I don't know. But uh, with these things as a tool against corruption, I would say yes, reform judiciary, but very, very careful and uh, to with sensitive approach. During the reform period, the system should be able to operate. We should not um, end up in a situation when people wanted uh, uh, to make a reform, but the people were eliminated, so there was no one to finish the reform. Maybe Mr. Lagnan can uh, say something, and after that we'll give the floor to Stanislav Pavlovsky, who would like to ask something. Mr. Lanigan, please, the floor is yours. It, it is important, um, certainly, to learn from the experience of uh, other countries that have struggled with similar issues. Um, and implemented uh, different reforms. 
uh, in order to address these issues. And I know that uh, the there are many stakeholders here uh, in government um, and in civil society that are looking at those examples and studying and studying those examples. I mean, I, I have heard, for example, um, the experience of uh, judicial and prosecutorial vetting um, in Albania um, described as um, as problematic or sometimes even described as a failure because of the time that's that's been taken. Um, um, I don't assess the experience there that way. Um, I, I think the, the the main lesson learned from that experience um, is that this kind of a vetting process um, takes longer um, than early rosy predictions um, you know, may have forecast. And I think the, um, the stakeholders here, um, the persons involved in developing the re reforms here have very much taken that lesson um, uh, into consideration in looking at the kinds of timeframes um, that they're looking at um, and also addressing the issue of particular institutions um, uh, uh, being inert for a period of time um, because um, of their of, of the uh, of the uh, disqualification or the the, the lack of um, qualification of uh, of uh, uh, critical um, uh, minimum membership um, in looking at um, a staging and sequenced um, approach here um, in order in order to avoid that problem. Um, but but the international experience and and a couple of speakers here um, ha have addressed this. Um, it is. Um, it is essential um, to look at how, as a practical matter, um, uh, accountability is going to be brought, um, if only by removing people who've demonstrated by the way they've performed their um, public trust responsibilities, removing them um, from their positions um, so that these institutions can operate properly and, and fairly and honestly. You know, the, the, the international experience certainly shows that it's essential um, to pay judges and prosecutors and other public servants um, appropriate salaries um, that exist at a level that you're going to attract and retain um, the kind of people that you want in these positions. Um, but there's no um, evidence um, in international practice um, that increasing the salaries um, of the subset of these officials um, who have functioned corruptly is going to get them to change their spots. Um, um, you can't, um, all you will have is a better paid subset of officials who continue to behave corruptly. So you need separate mechanisms that are um, either going to bring them um, to account um, through the criminal processes or the internal administrative processes um, or through an extraordinary mechanism like the vetting options um, that are being explored here. Um, both are necessary um, um, for the long run health of these institutions. Um, salaries and benefits need to be set um, at a level that's going to attract and retain the kind of people that you want operating honestly in these institutions. But that's not going to to cure um, the corrupt activity that's going on in these institutions. And you need other remedies for that. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. We will invite Mr. Pavlovsky to ask the question, but please, Mr. Pavlovsky, uh, formulate your question within one minute. I will try. Yes, I would like to address it in English language. So my question is the following. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, do you think that a legal system, a judiciary, where it does not exist any standard of proof could be considered as a legal system which is not generating a corruption? For instance, just to, clarify, just to clarify my question, I want to tell you that in Moldova, we have no standard of proof. In the United States, for instance, we have beyond the reasonable doubt standard of proof, which is raised at the level of a constitutional principle. In Moldova, we don't have a standard of proof even in our <clears throat> criminal procedure code. So my question is, do you consider it as a normal situation when judges are judging their cases without any standard of proof whatsoever? 
first question. Second question concerns, concerns um, um, judicial precedent. In Moldova, we don't have any judicial precedent, precedent and uh, decisions delivered by higher judicial authorities, they are not obligatory, they are not mandatory for lower judicial authorities. We know that uh, all judicial decisions could be divided in two parts. First part of decisions are principle setting decisions, and second part is principle applying decisions. So um, we don't have either principle setting decisions or principle applying decisions. In Moldova, uh, two judges having similar questions, uh, having similar or identical criminal cases could take diametrically opposed judicial decisions. So my second question is, do you think that introduction of a judicial precedent in Moldova could lead to reduction, objectively speaking, could lead to reduction of judicial uh, corruption? And the last question, and the last question, do you think it is a normal situation when a prosecutor who has conducted personally criminal investigation then goes to the court and maintains pleas before the court uh, uh, that case where he previously was acting as a, a kind of de facto criminal investigator? Thank you. For, uh, Mr. Pavlovsky, uh, a short question. For whom is the, your questions? Well, let it be addressed to our colleague from the United States. Okay. Um, Don Meningan, please. Um, sure. Um, the, uh, uh, certainly from the standpoint of um, an American lawyer, um, the uh, um, the lack of um, statutory or clear burdens of proof. Um, uh, um, from the standpoint of um, the American legal system and as an American lawyer, um, the, uh, the, the absence um, in Moldova law of clear burdens of proof in different kinds of both judicial and administrative proceedings um, is unusual, but it's not unusual in the continental civil um, legal systems. Um, the, um, I think it's also important to reflect that, you know, I think the, um, the, the great importance of these clear burdens of proof um, in the American legal system um, is in order to communicate to lay juries um, how to assess the facts um, and, to, and to reach a judgment and verdict um, in these cases, um, because we don't have, unlike Moldova, and, and most Western European countries, um, professional judiciaries who are the finders of fact, um, as well as the, the rulers on questions of law um, in these cases. So I don't, um, I, 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 would, I would be concerned um, if we suddenly lost these difference, uh, differences in stated burdens of proof in the United States because of the importance um, of um, these, uh, of the articulation and the definition of these burdens of proof um, in allowing juries um, to do their jobs. But without juries here, um, it, it is less important um, that there be clear stated burdens of proof. Um, in my assessment, um, I think that um, by and large, um, judges here um, are um, reaching their judgments um, uh, implicitly on the basis of what I would describe as a preponderance of the evidence or clear preponderance of the evidence standard, analogizing it to the American system. Um, you know, but, but I mean, I do think that um, throughout Europe in well-developed legal systems, um, you see a high quality of justice um, being rendered without clear statutory burden of, burdens of proof. And I don't, I don't see that um, as one of the, the major challenges that Moldova needs to uh, tackle right now. Um, it could be useful in the future, but I, I don't think it's one of um, the, uh, the current uh, legal challenges. Um, with, um, with the notion of um, um, bringing a system of precedent, of judicial precedent um, to Moldova, um, again, from an American lawyer's perspective, um, this 
this is an area of comfort for us um, uh, to, um, to work um, in a legal system um, where judicial precedent um, is so important. That's, that's not the tradition of continental civil legal systems. Um, I don't think um, that the lack of a judicial case law precedent system is one of the, the main challenges of justice reform in Moldova. Uniformity of practice, um, I, I do believe, um, is a major challenge here. But um, uh, a system of judicial precedent is not the only way to address that. Um, you know, there there are there are a variety of ways with uh, through Parliament narrowing uh, punishments that can be applied in particular cases um, that could make uh, a practice more uniform by the courts um, or sentencing guidelines, um, either advisory or mandatory that courts might have to follow um, in certain cases, um, or simply clear guidance um, from the Supreme Court of Justice um, to the lower courts um, in order to encourage or require um, increased uniformity of practice. Um, so there, there are other ways um, to address this issue um, without really overhauling um, the, the legal system entirely, introducing a system of um, judicial precedent that really would be transforming Moldova from a civil law to a common law system, which is an awfully big task. Thank you. Walton uh, Trebare, another question. We have not spoken today about a joint effort to fight corruption and reform the justice sector. We have uh, spoken about the fact that institutions need uh, changes, uh, laws need to be amended. My question uh, is addressed to all of the speakers from this panel. Does Moldova need new institutions to fight corruption? In the past days, we have been discussed about the future of the National Anti-Corruption Center. Should it uh, remain? Uh, does it have a role to play in the whole um, uh, construction that should uh, fight grand corruption and small-scale corruption as well? I will start with the officials. So, as I've said earlier, one of the recommendations of the report on the assessment of the National Anti-Corruption Center is a request for the government to come up with recommendations with regards to how to reset the competencies of National Anti-Corruption Center in cooperation with the competencies of the Anti-Corruption Prosecution Office. So, we would like to see the view of the Minister of Justice because uh, this resetting should be done, but I don't know what would be the opinion of the Minister of Justice. Of course, the scenarios are different. There are at least two scenarios that are somehow visible and were present in the public uh, speeches. Uh, so one of them is to merge these two institutions in a broad um, structure following the Romanian uh, model. And another option that is obvious somehow so we have to see the advantages and disadvantages risks and opportunities for each option so another one would be to offer uh, more competencies to the national anti-corruption center so that it does not blame always the anti-corruption prosecution office for its failure to deliver results for sure, these structures should uh, focus on investigating and uh, fighting grand systemic corruption. They should not focus on small-scale corruption, because it should be the competence of uh, police and territorial prosecution offices. If we want to have indeed uh, good results in our fight with corruption, then these two structures, regardless of um, the final form after they are resetting, they should deal with grand corruption. But nevertheless, in your opinion, do we need a new construction? It is difficult for me to answer to this question. 
what should be the final outcome of this resetting. I believe the Minister of Justice, together with the civil society, representatives of the parliament, of development partners, should uh, come around uh, a round table together with the decision makers from the anti-corruption prosecution, National Anti-Corruption Center. So they have to discuss together what are the advantages, disadvantages, opportunities of um, various scenarios and to find the most optimal um, scenario that, number one, will um, uh, deliver results the quickest, and number two, will facilitate um, reaching this result in the most optimal way. Thank you very much. Mr. Robo, I'm very uh, curious to find out your opinion. If... Uh, the Anti-Corruption Prosecution Office and National Anti-Corruption Center merge or are reorganized, will we have better results in fighting corruption or do we need another institution to fight efficiently corruption? I understood your question. Thank you very much. My personal opinion is that we do not need a new institution to fight corruption. And my personal opinion is that uh, it is not necessary to merge anti-corruption prosecution with the National Anti-Corruption Center. What we need to do is to reset both institutions and the anti-corruption uh, prosecution office and National Anti-Corruption Center should be tasked with investigating and fighting grant corruption because uh, until now both of them focused on the investigation of small-scale corruption and crimes. So uh, we need to amend the law and state the competence, the remit of both institutions, and we should state clearly that they are to deal with grand corruption and the small scale corruption to be given to the competence of territorial prosecution offices and police. But uh, have you felt any um, uh, difficulties in the cooperation between NAC and anti-corruption prosecution office? Do they blame each other? Do they have any issues? So my answer was clear. We need a resetting. So what do you mean by resetting? To change people or do we need to amend the law in terms of their mandate? I will not answer this question. But actually it's both, I think. Okay, Mr. Gribincha, please. And after that, the other guests. I will kindly ask them to reply to the same question. I think that we will have time after noon to speak about this topic, but I would like to briefly respond here as well. When in the kitchen you have two chefs, it cannot be a harmony. And the general explanation for Moldova is the more complex the architecture of institutions that are involved in this process, the worse it is. So we need one chef, a simple architecture with the competences. So we, you don't need additional institutions which will deal with small corruption. Small corruption can be investigated by a territorial prosecutor without any issues. The problem is that do these regional prosecutors have the courage to tackle that? And in order to tackle high level corruption, we need to have a responsible prosecutor. And what I wanted to say is that in 2016, when the law for prosecutors were amended and was the created the specialized prosecutor, there are many guarantees for independence, like separate budgets, separate human resources, separate uh, investigative officers, um, criminal investigation officers, their own experts, their own web page, their own stamp, their own everything. They're separated by the general prosecutor's office. They're 
five years, we are five years later, and nothing happened into practice. Okay, the personality of the leader is important, of the anti-corruption prosecutor's office is important, but it's important the entire team, if we could consolidate to the maximum this institution and to find 25 prosecutors, and I say that for Moldova, 25 prosecutors are enough to deal with high-level corruption. Okay, they're not going to ta tackle all corruption cases, but we need to prioritize. If we were able to uh, investigate 15 to 20 high-level cases to investigate them, to sentence them, then this will spill over and will deter other people who are tempted to do uh, corruption. So we have to deal with these high-level cases uh, very seriously. Okay, thank you so much. I have questions for Mr. Leningen, Ryaboshapka, and Dubravika. My question is a bit different. Moldova is trying to look at uh, different success stories from abroad, stories, success stories to fight corruption. For example, in Romania, they had a successful story with DNA. In other countries, they had different method. Is it correct for Moldova to copy foreign examples and to apply them into Moldova, hoping that they will be equal successful uh, just like it happened in other countries. Or each country needs to invent their own personalized model, which would correspond to the local realities, mentalities, and context. So what do you think, uh, Mr. Lanningen? I would like to start with you. I think you suggest um, two alternatives that are at the extreme um, and that the reality is really in the middle. Um, Moldova, like any state, should not just blindly look um, to the examples of other countries and copy them here. Um, Moldova also should not ignore um, the many lessons to be learned um, from the way other countries have dealt with similar problems and just try to invent something completely new here for the sake of being completely new here. Um, Moldova needs Moldovan solutions um, to the challenges in corruption and in other uh, respects that Moldova faces. But absolutely, um, Moldova should look to the example and the successes and the failures um, of other states um, in devising solutions um, that will work here and adapt um, successful models and interventions um, used elsewhere that have real data um, and a real track record of success um, and, and adapt them and apply them here. Thank you. I understand. Mr. Brevika, I have the same question for you. What do you think is best? To you, Mr. Dubravika, it, it's better to invent your own method. Each country should invent their own method or to copy a method applied successfully in another country. Mr. Dubravika? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This is always a question. In many countries, there is no standard uh, copy-paste solutions. Something that is working in one country sh shouldn't work in other country. I don't know, some time ago, it was very popular to copy solutions from uh, Hong Kong in the European countries. Now, they're not mentioning anymore how I didn't hurt in the last time. So I think for Moldova, would be the best to check solutions from other countries, especially the neighbor countries with similar historic or similar economic situation. As it now, you have enough good examples in your neighborhood from Romania to other countries and to trying to apply these solutions on Moldovian situation, but of course not, not with copy paste system. As Mr. Kevin said, uh, Moldova needs Moldovian solutions. And I'm sure that, uh, and I know that Moldova has enough uh, smart and capable people to do it, to read other 
experiences, to learn from it, not to repeat mistakes of others, and to find what is the best solution learning from this other experience in Moldova. Thank you. Uh, and Mr. Ryaboshapka, what is your opinion? I fully agree with my colleagues that Moldova should choose its own way and its own model, which is based on local realities and local peoples, local traditions. I don't think uh, I don't think the Romanian um, example would fit um, ideally for Moldova, because as I understand in, in Romania. The anti-corruption prosecutors, they are working with uh, delegated uh, police officers. And I don't think that this model is like, um, uh, would be uh, effective for, for Moldova, because Moldova has its uh, um, separate anti-corruption investigative bodies. I don't think that all of all these investigators from the anti-corruption centers are corrupt or are incompetent. I would use these people also in terms of um, resetting or after resetting of a new anti-corruption body. Uh, in any case, it's up to Moldova to decide which model is uh, is the best one. When we designed our anti-corruption infrastructure in Ukraine, we decided to have uh, different separate authorities, anti-corruption prosecutor's office and investigative body, which is National Anti-Corruption Bureau. Uh, the, Two key issues were for us the most important. First is specialization. It means that this anti-corruption body uh, should deal only with grant cases. And we um, separated all the even uh, medium and small cases um, and give powers to, to investigate them to other bodies. So the first issue is specializations on grant cases. The second, and perhaps this one is the most important, is guarantee of its independence. There were a lot of attempts to dismiss uh, Sitnik, Artem Sitnik from the position of um, head of NABU. And thanks to the law on National Anti-Corruption Bureau, he, he kept his position and he managed to, uh, to to build a national anti-corruption bureau as an effective anti-corruption structure in Ukraine. So uh, the guarantees of independence should be one of the most important issue, along with the uh, specializations. Thank you very much. Um, we have a question or an opinion from Mr. Eduard Harzan. I understand this is the prosecutor, or maybe not. He writes, is it justified the vetting for judges and the prosecutors because they cannot clean the system from within? This is also said after the fact that the justice and prosecutor's office were captive by one system or another. So there's no chance for the justice to clean itself from the inside. Maybe today we have the right time uh, to initiate the cleaning since uh, some general prosecutors and judges accept the vetting idea. Maybe we do need to have international experts to do the vetting so that we uh, so that we do this process. Maybe we should also discuss about the negative effects of vetting, uh, which happened in Albania and Ukraine and maybe in other countries. So this is a half opinion and half question. So the question is, can the vetting be done internally without involving external forces when the reality is that the political control is not, or the political um, arena is not influencing or controlling anymore the justice sector. So if we say that, can we assume that internal vetting is possible? 
Thank you so much for the question. I think that the situation in the justice sector, I hope, it's different than the reality that existed several years ago and even last year. I hope very much that the general prosecutors, prosecutors, judges are breathing easier now that there's no political influence telling them what they should do for one case or another. But at the same time, this system cannot change overnight by itself, in my opinion. This system is built according to a certain infrastructure uh, architecture. We have a, a superior council of uh, magistracy and we have specialized consuls which were elected. Uh, their members were elected by judges again and when they were elected into function they did not have a critical mass of honest and integral judges who can vote equally honest colleagues judges which can be part of these important councils and specialized councils a similar thing happens at the prosecutor's office and their specialized councils because these are the bodies who do performance assessment or should do even performance assessment and apply disciplinary measures so this is internal management so this is bes besides the indirect uh, cleaning like uh, investigations like uh, ensuring integrity by verifying potential uh, problems in asset declaration so it's a whole mechanism that should ensure the delivery of these results where each link is functioning so in case each link of this system is working then this means that we don't need external vetting at this present moment not all links and actually any of i would say none of the links function at their highest capacity or at the right level and this is why the chain is defective okay we come with amendments of the laws we amend the legislation to balance to fix the links uh, or to fix the value chain and to to consolidate each link but it could happen at some point that we see that external vetting of judges and prosecutors doesn't need to happen. And from these reasons, the concept that for vetting, which is proposed by Ministry of Justice, has three main phases. The first phase is the highest level, second is medium, and the third is the lowest level. So this means that at some point you can stop the vetting or do it for some people. Yes. I don't see why not to stop at some phase or at, after two phases we can stop the process if we notice that the system is working well and we see that the system is capable to do internal vetting, internal cleaning. So after we launch the process we say what are the objectives and standards. If we notice that the entire system is following these objectives and standards we stop and we notice this in Albania truly it worked and there are some lessons that they learned and we tried to learn from their experience to anticipate some mistakes here we don't want to jump into the same errors we want to anticipate but i'm sure we will have our own mistakes yes i think it's normal that each process to have some problems some uh, failures this is normal nobody can avoid mistakes every process launched no matter how much you try to avoid difficulties and mistakes you will have them and you have to be ready for them you need to uh, react to these mistakes and correct them in albania some aspects were not prepared in advance and we try to anticipate these problems we try to prepare ourselves so that we can face 
the challenges. This is why we plan three phases. This is why we plan to increase the number of public hearing. Uh, we are looking to um, uh, recruit and uh, to hire. So in case we find ourselves with the lack of human resources, we have a pool of individuals from which to uh, select. So we're trying to prevent the errors that Albania faced and we're trying to um, uh, get ready for these challenges and additional challenges which are going to happen during the vetting process. Thank you so much. Mr. Gribinch, if you would like to add something to what was said, the topic of the next I understand it's not the topic of our panel discussion, but is related if we are speaking about what is the effect of this uh, corruption fight. Yes, yesterday we spoke about vetting two and a half hours. And the big conclusion that was taken at the end is the fact that yes, the vetting procedure could bring benefits only if it's done according to the book, right? Having a competent authority, having transparency, having clear criteria, clear bodies, uh, involving the development partners, uh, offering uh, methods for appeal, and so on. But looking at Albania, we understand that this can take a long time and we have to think about how we calibrate the expectations and the process. But the vetting process does not solve the lack of professionalism and competencies of the judges and prosecutors. So I have to think about this as well. I hope that if we apply this mechanism, this will be applied uh, taking into account the issues that occurred in Ukraine and Albania. Because it's wrong to believe that this vetting can be given to be implemented or run by those who are going to be evaluated. So we cannot expect the judges to do the vetting. Uh, we have all of these authorities uh, being suspected uh, or being subject to be vetting. Bec why? Because they never did their job. If all these prosecutors, judges, lawyers, anti-corruption lawyers, they never did their job. Okay, but uh, they always blamed the political uh, sector. They said that the political pressure did not allow them to do their job. Now the political pressure is gone. Do do you think they should receive the chance to clean themselves from the inside or this is not possible? Also, the society believes that uh, the society will never believe the internal changes done by the system itself. This is why there is the need for somebody external to come in to do the vetting so that to return the trust back to the society that this cleaning took place. Uh, well, we spoke about uh, different reforms and uh, halfway reforms don't function. You either do a full reform or don't do it at all. Another truth is the following. A hope for a good reform, it's not the sustainable strategy. And it's hard for me to say that people who have a stained reputation can come back to clean their reputation. We all know that there is a close connection between integrity and independence of justice maker. If the individual has uh, some sins, they will not be able to act independently and according to the law. I see no issue for these judges to go through the vetting, but this vetting either is done by the book or it's not done at all. Because if we do it badly, if we allow it to be done by judges, if we allow the political subordination of justice, then it's going to be uh, worse than just don't do it at all. But we had the political subordination until now, so 
uh, if there are other co uh, speakers who would like to comment on this topic, please take the floor. If not, I propose to go to the conclusions. I invite each speaker to uh, uh, take one minute and to uh, mention what are the conclusions. But I would kindly ask you to stay on our topic to combat uh, corruption. How can we combat corruption so that the citizens feel these changes? Because let's not forget that these changes and fighting corruption is done for the citizens. I would like to start with Mr. Ryaboshapka. It's almost impossible to make a right decision on how to to have a victory uh, over corruption in one minute in, uh, in Moldova. Uh, you know, I would rely a lot on cooperation between government, which is excellent government. This is the first time in Moldova when we have uh, such an excellent opportunity uh, to rely on a combination of government and civil society. I would also explore the possibility of um, inviting the external or civil society experts in the process of uh, vetting of judges and prosecutors, or in, vet, in process of vetting of Supreme Council of uh, Magistrates and Supreme Council of Prosecutors. In Ukraine, such kind of combination of efforts of government and civil society, um, in many cases, it it uh, it gives uh, it give us a, a lot of positive results. Uh, in my case of Latino prosecutors in the office of the prosecutor general in Ukraine, um, we invited uh, external experts in this process, and it was a key issue why, why this process was successful. It was transparent and it was trustful by citizens. Uh, in case uh, there were also some uh, attempts in Ukraine to um, reset the judiciary, um, in these attempts, uh, a lot of powers uh, were relied on, on, on judges themselves, and they failed. So uh, another case when we established the current corruption court, we also relied on civil society, and it was created a selection commission uh, with um, composed of members of civil society. And in this case, we again have a, a very good positive results. So the key uh, the key recept, uh, receipt I think is combination of efforts from government and civil society. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all institutions of Moldova must start to cooperate and to focus on combating high-level corruption. Once this level of corruption will disappear, low-level corruption will follow to disappear as well and this is my opinion so we need to have a cooperation between all the institutions integrity agency anti-corruption agency prosecutor's office anti-corruption prosecutor's office and others so we need to collaborate and do you think we have enough tools you don't feel that something is missing to have this cooperation well we need to have a cooperation. Maybe it's needed to do some amendments in the legislation to define again the competences of anti-corruption prosecutor's office and how to combat high-level corruption, to just define it in the legislation. Madam Stamatia, well, me, I like to see uh, the general uh, picture. And I think that our efforts are going to focus from the parliamentary level to work on the legislation to amend the points that are needed to, in order to reduce the risk for corruption on some segments to facilitate the investigations in order to combat corruption cases. At the same time, in parallel with combating corruption we are going to have uh, activities for economic support of the population especially during this crisis period mentioned by the government supporting the population is necessary including by raising the wages as much as it's possible and as much maneuver the public budget is giving us and 
of course, we always uh, uh, supported the participation of foreign experts in such exercises, especially if we speak about external vetting of judges and prosecutors. I think one of the key elements is this involvement of external experts, and this will give a higher credibility for the citizens in the results of this uh, vetting in the transparency of the process and the cooperation with the civil society i don't have many things to say here because i don't know if somebody from the civil society has objection to this um if uh, they we are always open for cooperation for opinion for critics but if there are any uh, civil society organization who considers that we're not uh, uh, as open as we think we are here to listen and to amend the situation thank you so much um, there's been a crisis of confidence uh, by citizens in the justice system for many many years um, in moldova and and this is a crisis that needs to be addressed um, in the long run, um, maybe even in the medium and the short run, the internal mechanisms to ensure judicial integrity and, and prosecutor integrity need to work and they need to be made to work. Um, maybe there's legislative reform, further legislative reform there or internal regulatory reform, um, certainly personnel reform um, that is needed to make these internal mechanisms work. Um, these, these bodies, Chesame and Chesape, um, the colleges that work under them, um, if they do begin um, demonstrating um, that they're functioning in a way that they didn't appear to function in the past, um, they could serve themselves quite well um, during this period of time um, uh, when the government and parliament is looking at, um, at different mechanisms. Um, but the right of the, the protection of judicial independence, um, the point has been made um, several times yesterday and today. Um, what is being protected there is the citizen's right to a fair trial, not the judge's right to um, impunity. Um, and that citizen's right to a fair trial is a right um, that, that needs to be guaranteed today and tomorrow, this year and next year, and not just five or 10 years from now, when these internal mechanisms um, might um, begin working better. Um, and so Moldova is right to be looking um, at interventions and remedies um, that can accelerate um, the cleansing of agencies and sectors um, that, that need to be cleansed in. with the citizens having confidence and having reason to have confidence um, in the effectiveness of those interventions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Donu Dubra Vika, I'm going to intervene. Next. We are see you. Yes, Mr. okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, in my first presentation, I was talking about uh, some solutions and uh, what the gaps are and what can be improved. But uh, here, for as a final conclusion, I would uh, focus on the two, the slowest methods, but under my opinion, the most effective methods. One of them I already mentioned, it's the uh, development of economy and the free market, especially based on the new technologies. And it seems it starts to happen. The other one is uh, improving of education system. Here, I don't think about anti-corruption education. I think about overall education system. Schools and universities must produce uh, active and interested citizens, citizens who will think with their own head. Such citizens can't be victims of populism and fake news. These citizens will recognize what is good and what is wrong. When we look to the countries with the lowest corruption rate 
it's this country has the best education system, for example, like Denmark. It is not coincidence. So this is the slowest method. It needs a years for this, but it's once it's time to start. Thank you. So I was saying that it is difficult to be the last to speak. But again, in my presentation, I've mentioned a list of priorities and activities that can be implemented in order to make fight against grant corruption more efficient. I will try to speak about more general issues now, which are also very important. The first one is uh, the trust in reforms, the trust in the good intentions of those that are initiating the reforms, that they are doing this change in order to change things for the better, uh, not in order to replace people uh, with their own people. Uh, I think that uh, happened in Moldova for decades, so we have to change this paradigm so that we have the public trust that the changes are done with good intentions, not in order to take uh, control over the justice sector and to put their people that are from your circle of friends. Two, to identify champions. Uh, people is what matters we might have perfect laws but unless we have good people to implement them the effect will be the same uh, moreover it is easier to govern an institution with good people and not so good laws than vice versa so identifying champions uh, is very important and when i say champions i do not think only about people from within the system but also from outside of the system but if they do not have the trust that the changes are done with good intentions they will not come and number three any person that gets power in his or her hands and uh, when we are in top positions, then uh, there is a lot of power in one person's hand. I would say, for example, that Mr. Robu maybe is the most powerful person in the state now. So such a big power can corrupt uh, anyone. That is why we need to put in place safeguards. And the most efficient safeguard is a transparent activity of the prosecution. Why don't we have a semi-public register where we could find out who is investigated, when a criminal investigation started, so that we know why, for example, a certain case is not finished for years already. Another important element is good thinking and synchronization of reforms with other reforms. And here, what I've seen recently, after the elections, I've seen rather a total desynchronization of some well-intended initiatives. I believe that if we write on paper a good action plan, what reforms should be done, how and when is very, very important, both for the government to achieve its goals and for the development partners to be able to help with the implementation of these reforms. And the last thing I would like to mention, lead by example, is an expression that should be implemented here give a good example those from the government for the others and they will replicate it i would go even further with a statement made by the former prime minister of singapore if you want to fight indeed corruption start with your own friends you know why and they know why as well and i'm sure that there are persons that have scenes in the political party pass start with them that would be the best example for uh, the whole system so that's a great recommendation at the end of a session where we discussed about combating uh, corruption i just want to highlight some things that i remembered a thing said by Mr. Ryaboshapka about the fact that Moldova has now more opportunities than Ukraine when it started cleaning its system and fighting corruption. And the second message 
made by Mr. Uh, Dubravica. The good, the bad guys uh, replace each other. That's why you do not have the right to relax ever. That's a continuous effort to fight corruption. There are possibilities, there are opportunities to do it now. But unfortunately, the bad guys are still having powers in many key areas that can affect the security of the Republic of Moldova. My uh, Sunday's uh, um, um, show will focus on this uh, threat that we have in the energy sector. So what we want to wish you is for you to find these uh, bad guys to bring them in front of the court and uh, for the court to be able to do justice, uh, true justice, and for other bad guys not to be able to replace the ones that are removed. I don't know if it's possible for the fight corruption to have an irreversible effect, but maybe the Republic of Moldova would be a model for the whole region by its example of fighting radically corruption so that it does not come back into the society. Thank you very much to all the speakers in this session. Uh, those that are watching online, I would like to remind that at uh, 1.30 p.m. we will have another session. We will continue the discussions about corruption. Uh, the session is entitled Investigation and Sanctions for the Grand Corruption. I would like to mention that the forum is organized by the Legal Resources Center from Moldova in partnership with the government of Moldova and uh, Sweden. And we would like to invite you to join us in the second part of the day.
Hello. Hello and lots of health to everyone, because health is what we need the most in order to get rid of this unwanted guest called COVID. And we also need health uh, for our justice sector that is severely affected by a disease called the injustice, because this injustice um, undermined the rule of law and statehood of the Republic of Moldova. That is why this forum today uh, has the goal to bring more light over what was done in the justice sector and what should be done next. And uh, in uh, this panel, we will discuss about investigation and sanctions for the ground corruption. This event is organized by the Legal Resources Center from Moldova, together with the government of the Republic of Moldova and in partnership with the Swedish Embassy to the Republic of Moldova. And we have the following guests speaking in this panel. State Secretary of the Ministry of Justice, Julian Russo. Hello and welcome. Thank you for your presence. Deputy Chief of Anti-Corruption Prosecution Office, Mr. Iwan Muntano. Welcome. Remotely, through teleconference, we will discuss with the Director of National Anti-Corruption Bureau of Ukraine, Artyom Sitnik. Welcome. So, uh, it will be a pleasure for us to find out the viewpoint from the neighboring country regarding the situation over there, because uh, it seems that uh, our two countries are trying to do the same thing in terms of justice sector reform. The next guest <coughs> is the um, anti-corruption expert from Expert Forum Romania, also remotely, Laura Stefan. Hello. Thank you for being with us. Hopefully, we will have a confirmation that you are already present online. Our co my colleague, reporter of Rise Moldova, Ion Preaschka. Hello, Ion. and a lawyer from Center for Analysis and Prevention of Corruption of, of the Republic of Moldova, Lilia Ioannice, welcome. And thank you for accepting our invitation to be present at this important event organized by Legal Resources Center from Moldova, together with the government of the Republic of Moldova and in partnership with the Swedish Embassy to Chisinau. In the Moldovan society, there are so many discussions about this corruption and about the need to unroot this um, phenomenon. Our people are still living with the perception that those that are doing justice try to catch the small fish and when they meet sharks, they arrest them, maybe they keep them a couple of days uh, in detention and then the case is either forgotten or, or the accused one is released and does not bear any accountability for the bad things done. That is why the voice of people is very important to me, because the voice of people is also called the voice of God. And my colleagues from um, uh, Radio Free Europe made a Vox Populi to find out the opinion of people about how the grand corruption is investigated and sanctioned. Please, let us see the Vox Populi. Regarding corruption, I, I have not seen anyone uh, arrested except for Filat. So, did you see any sanction enforced? Only Filat. We, we need a uh, um, prosecutor from abroad. Why are you waiting for them to leave? But how, how do you think, why are there are so many delays? Because a lot of money is involved. If they stole billions, they have enough money to 
give bribes to the lawyers, to judges, how should they be sanctioned? To confiscate their wealth. If you have worked uh, your whole life in the public sector and you have lots of cars and big uh, houses, the law should be the same for everybody. Uh, it does not matter that you work in the government or parliament. But what is wrong? The anti-corruption uh, office is fighting the corruption, but only as a show. They protect each other. But what about the existing institutions? Anti-corruption prosecution, uh, National Anti-Corruption uh, Center, they are friends among themselves. How should, will we get rid? Well, the only thing is to leave the country. I believe that the beginning is good, uh, but I don't think uh, that uh, there are many smaller actions that hopefully will result to a grand result. Laura Kodruza should come from the European Union. She managed to do good things in Romania. If you want to do something, it's not enough to have uh, the prosecution office or the National Anti-Corruption Center in Moldova, no state institutions work for the benefit of citizens. Thank you very much for these opinions collected on the streets um, by our colleagues from Radio Free Europe. So we saw one more time that people do not trust the institutions tasked with fighting corruption. You have seen that the last person interviewed said there is no prosecution office, there is no National Anti-Corruption Center, though they are present in the Republic of Moldova. We will speak about their activity in a couple of minutes. Now some information will be provided by Oksana Brigidin, legal advisor at the, at the Legal Resources Center from Moldova. Hello, I am Oksana Brigidin, legal advisor at Legal Resources Center from Moldova. In the next uh, couple of minutes, uh, let me present uh, the result of a survey about the investigation and sanctions for the grand corruption in the Republic of Moldova. According to the survey conducted by the Legal Resources Center from Moldova in 2020 among prosecutors, judges and lawyers regarding justice, sector and corruption, when asked where uh, there is the highest level of corruption uh, in the units of prosecution, most of them replied that the anti-corruption prosecution office is the most corrupt institution in the country. So the institution that needs to fight corruption was viewed by prosecutors, lawyers and judges as being the most corrupt. The second one is the prosecutor to combat uh, organized crime and special causes and then the general prosecution office. The trust in the National Anti-Corruption Center is not higher as well. According to the Public Opinion Barometer of 2021, two-thirds of uh, respondents, 36.7 percent, do not uh, trust uh, the um, National Anti-Corruption Center. According to the same uh, Public Opinion Barometer, when asked who are the most corrupt in the country, 26.7 percent meaning most of those interviewed, said that these are the members of parliament. We have to mention that this survey was uh, conducted before the parliament was dissolved. Maybe that is why we have uh, these uh, figures. After that, that we have uh, uh, doctors, police officers and customs officials. In 2020, courts, first instance courts, pronounced the least number of sentences on corruption cases over the past five years, according to the activity report of the prosecution office for 2020. This is mainly due to the COVID-19 pandemic and restrictions imposed because of that. And according to this report, Three out of four sentences were convictions. 56% of the convicted persons were sanctioned to prison. Only 6.3% of them went to the prison, were actually deprived of their liberty, compared to 11% uh, compared uh, in the 2019. Whereas um, 50%, uh, uh, their sanction was suspended. They went home. 
The other sanctions were fines and uh, free community work. Uh, three prosecutors, two bailiffs, six lawyers, three criminal investigation officers and eight uh, investigation officers are th among the convicted ones. Thank you very much for your attention and I wish to have interesting discussions further on. Thank you very much, Oksana, for presenting the summary of the outcome of a survey that was conducted last year. I don't know if the situation changed significantly in 2021 compared to last year. Julian Russo, you have the floor. You can tell us more. What is your opinion with regards to the results of the survey and about what is happening today in this very important area in terms of investigation and sanctioning of grand corruption? First, I would like to thank you for the invitation. Mrs. Valentina, yes, indeed, this topic is, I believe, the biggest concern of our society. Maybe the second concern is uh, about the energy sector situation. But um, in spite of the importance of the second topic, the first one will remain and actually has been a topic of interest for many years. And this topic, and this is confirmed by opinion polls, by the public opinion barometer that is conducted for more than 20 years already, where corruption is listed as one of the biggest problems of our country. I will start by saying my own opinion about the interaction between the grand corruption and small-scale corruption. The perception is that this small-scale corruption is generated by the grand corruption because the grand corruption erodes the economic and practical possibilities of our people. Due to the grand corruption, investors do not want to come in our country. We lose public resources that are used inefficiently through public uh, procurements and um, as a result of this, the income of people are lower under a certain threshold and because of that some people are somehow forced to use acts of corruption but at a small scale so fighting corruption should uh, first uh, result in an active identification of those people. But if we are to analyze what corruption means, it is a financial benefit. So in order to prevent corruption, we have to focus on the outcomes generated by this act or the outputs of this act. In other words, we have to focus on confiscating the wealth gained through corruption, because this is also a prevention tool. What we have in Moldova, we have two articles on confiscation, special confiscation and uh, extended confiscation, which are quite limited in terms of their scope and enforcement when we have grand corruption. These two articles are applicable when there is a criminal case. There is another form of confiscation outside the criminal uh, proceeding, it, the so-called administrative confiscation. It was introduced recently in our law and it is a part of the work of National Integrity Authority. And there are no other forms of confiscation, though they should exist, because as one of our people has correctly mentioned, the first question that we have to ask ourselves is how can uh, public officials explain this uh, huge wealth that they have when their legal income is much lower? Such practices exist in EU member countries, which uh, apply the test of uh, checking the wealth and if wealth cannot be justified it is confiscated 
and uh, we do not have uh, in such a, a situation uh, such a big uh, burden uh, of proof like in the case of a criminal investigation. Other aspects related to functionality already. Grant corruption can be efficiently combated as long as uh, the authorities, the institutions are strong. What we have now in terms of the number of uh, prosecutors that are active in the anti-corruption uh, prosecution office and prosecution office against uh, specialized um, uh, cases and organized crime versus the number of prosecutors in the general prosecution office uh, is that the number of general prosecution office is bigger uh, in terms of number of prosecutors. Uh, so the question is what is our priority now? Um, let's choose the best prosecutors from the country that work well, that are honest, that love their job and work with dedication. And there are such people in territorial prosecution offices as well, not necessarily in Kishina only. So let's uh, tap into these resources that we have and concentrate them in our specialized prosecution offices to help the current prosecutors that started this file or resumed this fight after a, a period of being absent. Yesterday I watched uh, a part of the meeting of the parliament where they examined the report of the investigative committee on the activity of the um, National Anti-Corruption Center. And a series of alarming data were revealed. The speaker even made some jokes. Who is this Gena who managed to collect such big amounts of wealth and he was interested how to invest uh, half a million of euro in uh, wind mills, though the intention is very good, but this employee of the National Anti-Corruption Center is a public official. So the question is very simple. What are the sources of this wealth that uh, Gena managed to accumulate? So that's obvious that we have a lack of integrity in the system and we have to respond in a prompt and active manner to that. In addition to that, let's analyze the competencies of the anti-corruption prosecution and the competencies of the NAC. NAC has a structure of more than 300 people and a huge budget uh, uh, which is not, uh, uh, which is a luxury compared to other public authorities, but at the same time, the efficiency is not the highest. They have many cases that are closed, others are delayed uh, uh, for three, four, or five years. So it is obvious that we need to restructure the relationship between anti-corruption prosecution. A prosecution office against organized crime and special uh, cases with other authorities that can provide investigative officers and criminal investigation officers. To put it briefly, we have to implement the Romanian model because it would be very appropriate for the Republic of Moldova. Besides um, allocating enough human resources, the anti-corruption prosecution office needs to have investigation officers or criminal investigation officers that should be seconded and not only from one single um, institution, not only from NAC. Once we target grand corruption cases and as a result of which we'll manage to recover assets and here it is very important to foster, to give um, a, um, an impulse to the, uh, uh, the identification of assets abroad and also it's important to cooperate strongly with our partners uh, from abroad. So in such a way we'll be able to bring back the assets that were obtained unlawfully. Uh, and a last thing regarding criminal law. Unfortunately, many cases that are investigated in the court 
result in uh, a conditional sanctioning of uh, imprisonment or uh, uh, the person is sanctioned with um, uh, detention but the uh, minimum number of years is uh, imposed or uh, as a result of this after the prosecutors or criminal investigation officers are investigating a case uh, there are judges who are very indulgent with the persons that committed cases of corruption and this should not happen we are also interested in a complex review of the provisions of the criminal code with regards to various forms of decreasing the criminal punishment but also we are interested to toughen the uh, sanctions for corruption, especially for grant corruption. Thank you very much, Yulian Rusu, State Secretary at the Minister of Justice. And now I would like to give the floor to Yuan Muntiano, Deputy Chief at Anti-Corruption Prosecution Office. Mr. Muntiano, what was your reaction when somebody from the Vox Populi um, said that the anti-corruption uh, prosecution is the most corrupted one? Hello, dear State Secretary. Hello, dear dear audience. Hello, people watching us online. I would like to thank the organizer for extending this invitation to participate to this forum and to present some of my personal opinion and my colleagues. In the uh, as a general, as a prosecutor, I've been active for 10 years, for 15 years and more than 10 in anti-corruption prosecution. If to speak about prosecuting high-level corruption cases, I would like to start by saying that, first of all, I would like to explain some of the obstacles and problems that we have every day while we investigate these cases, which are complete, extremely complex. And also, I would like to propose some solutions or at least some opinions that we believe that could help. So these solutions or amendments could help or would bring more efficiency and it will facilitate the work that we uh, place on these criminal cases. I would like to say that in the legislation we don't have the term of high level corruption and we don't have additional points on it. So once the m amendments for the prosecutor's law, it was added the specialized prosecutor and also the law from 2016 was amended and in my opinion, it was attempted to identify the big corruption. First, it was created the anti-corruption agency. Uh, also, uh, the commission, uh, it was introduced the, the possibility to investigate high-level officials, also to identify the uh, criminal cases where the um, bribe value or the value of goods or the um, damage of the corrupt act is higher than uh, 2.5 million lay. In essence, I think it was not a bad idea, but the reality which occurred after this amendment was the following. In 2016, about the same uh, prosecutors uh, uh, came back to uh, analyze um, uh, 70 cases according to the new competences, and these cases were taken from the um, NAS. As it was mentioned in the National Anti-Corruption Agency, it's a huge body with a, a 10 times more workers who, who can do investigation on these cases. So these cases which they were supposed to analyze were taken away from them. Also, we would like to mention that all these criminal cases are pretty complex. It means a huge volume of work and many of them were older than two, three years. At the same time, the main job of the the prosecutors did not change. They may, we continue to do the investigation and to prepare the defense, the um, accusation. Therefore, when the prosecutor does criminal investigation, about f he works on 40, 50 cases, and he has uh, more cases 
plus supporting uh, uh, other 50, 60 cases for the state uh, institutions. So it's a huge volume. Okay, the law amended in 2016, there were uh, created investigative officers and criminal investigation officers who are, have the role to support the efforts of the prosecutors. How this turned out in reality? Well, initially were delegated sufficiently um, investigative uh, officers and uh, criminal uh, uh, investigation officers, and slowly they left their position. Why? Because because of huge volume of work, because of low wages, and we are left with a handful of officers. And with these officers, there's another problem. It's written in the law, but the prosecutor's office doesn't have the competences to do special investigations. So. Uh, it seems that the general prosecutor has uh, officers who do everything except the investigation. If to speak again about the high level corruption or big corruption, uh, if we don't speak about the subject of investigations, which are usually very influent, uh, very, very public people, the investigation of corruption acts have usually a high complexity. And in the majority of the cases, I can tell you that it um, goes over the head of personal skills, technical skills, time frame, time allocated of the prosecutors. And then again, I have to say, when we are talking about high level of public funds, there is a scheme. And sometimes when I identify such a scheme, I'm completely overwhelmed. I'm shocked how complex and how smart that scheme is. And I can assure you that these schemes are implemented by or with the support of well prepared professionals in this sector. Just to give you or cheers to open the brackets. The case of uh, uh, real estate um, which were uh, lost from the control of the state. There are some real estate or buildings which cannot be uh, removed from the property of the state, but they were rented out or they were left to destroy until and then sold by sell for pennies. So the scheme was the following. Uh, these uh, buildings were very poorly managed and then they were taken over by other uh, private investors. So it's impossible to prove here the, the intent and the cooperation with local public authorities is very hard. We sometimes have an investigation, we identify the damage, we ask the local public authority and they say, we have no, uh, no damages. But of course, they're not gonna report any damage because they are in hand with the other uh, um, uh, people who want to uh, remove these buildings from the ownership of the state. And then uh, there's many things that which cannot be done by the prosecutor. For example, uh, if we do some investigation, we need to involve the intelligence service or the Ministry of Internal Affairs, and we have problems. There were many cases of uh, leaking information, disappearing information. In addition to this, uh, we have difficulties with the technical process to do this cooperation and plan these activities. So this is very complicated. If you would like, I can give you more details on how to assign, um, first of all, how to accept um, audio uh, materials uh, of hidden, hidden uh, conversations. It's not always admitted into court, even though they are collected according to the law, other times it's not collected according to the law. And if to speak about the illicit obtained assets, it's not an easy job because of the cross-border character of these crimes. Many times the subject of the investigation managed to purchase or to move outside of the borders of the country. These goods. Therefore, we are in the situation to uh, create commissions to uh, start investigations across uh, border. And oftentimes, these requests are left without a reply or the reply is coming very long. Also, uh, in a currently open case, 
pretty popular case, I would say. The prosecutor requested a uh, accounting expertise. So launching this expertise is uh, uh, scheduled for March 2022 and it cost 130,000 lei. And this is just the beginning in this case. It's not, um, maybe it will not be enough to have this accounting expertise and we would need additional expertise, which will cost again. So this is a huge uh, expense. Next, I would like to speak about the lack of cooperation between different uh, state institutions. Oftentimes we are refused or just ignored. Uh, many times we have to uh, make our own steps to do uh, checkups, to accumulate evidences because we don't have their support. Also, we should not forget about the role of lawyers. When we start the investigation or we identify a subject which is uh, a arrested or detained, immediately he has two, three lawyers. So sometimes it's hard for me to understand what is the point to which is defense of the lawyer and what is the point of abuse uh, from the lawyers. So oftentimes the lawyers bombard us with contestation, with uh, uh, refusals, with uh, the request. Um, I understand that the lawyers must do their job, but what is, where is the limit? Why do they contest uh, an order of the inferior prosecutor? They said that they need a uh, order signed by the general prosecutor. And I explained to them, not every order or request must be signed by the general prosecutor. The um, lower level prosecutors have the same uh, power. And I can guarantee that a quarter of these meetings are delayed, not because of the prosecutor, it's just the delays caused by the lawyers. They invoke millions of reasons. Now the most popular reason is the pandemic. So they are um, delaying very much the entire procedure. Another complicated process is the process of uh, uh, re uh, receiving authorizations from uh, the judges. So in order to launch criminal investigation, we do the following. We do a request, we do a copy of the file, and sometimes these are full boxes of papers. So we have three printers in which work non-stop sometimes for days in order to um, argument to prove our request. And we go to the j courthouse, the prosecutor uh, submits this uh, volume of paper, waits for a meeting when the judge can examine all of this and um, days later we can receive approval or um, or not. So we need them to authorize that request much faster than they're doing now. And it's a problem. I think it's enough time. They maybe can use digital signature, maybe digital copies. It's not normal in the 21st century to be requested uh, that we present boxes of papers and we need the physical signature of the judge. Things can be done faster. Another thing, just like I said at the moment, uh, anti-corruption uh, agency, we don't have enough staff members. The prosecutors are fully involved in all the procedures, starting with the general aspects, um, tracking, statistics, seminars, trainings, etc. All of these tasks require time and attention. And there is also monthly reporting, quarter reporting for uh, different state institutions. And this reporting is done based on the manual register. Me, as a leading prosecutor, I should not even create all these reports. 
Me, I, I must complete manually 12 register manually. Why do I have to do this in 2020? Because uh, I uh, had the uh, previously this position in 2020, we received a lot of critics and we had a verification and we were asked, where are all your registers? And my explanation was, of course, I'm doing this digitally, electronically. I don't need to have this uh, physical uh, register. And we were told, no, you should not do this. It's a simple thing, but now we are forced to work, uh, uh, to do this manual w work. And at the end of the case, the prosecutor, which investigates two of the most popular cases, and they do the reporting counting sticks basically based on the register that each prosecutor must complete manually so they have to open each of them and to do it manually so in order for me to be part of any investigation I cannot give more than 30% of my time it's the same with the regular prosecutors they have way too many things to do which take their time uh, and there are many ideas who don't work. Uh, for example, there are many cases which are not, which are maintained alive only at the insistence of the bosses. There's no data, there's no evidence for that case, but they're maintained uh, uh, thanks to the case, uh, to, thanks to the support of the bosses, not even to mention the lack of translators, the lack of expertise that we need, like banking, fiscal, whatever you would like to imagine sometimes we are used to we are using google translate just to understand what is mentioned in those documents another issue is the preparation of the uh, prosecutors uh, for example i'm sorry for taking so much time when you take a case you cannot remove that case after two, three months uh, and remove the case from one prosecutor and give it to another. We have to give them time enough to understand, to work on it, especially if we're talking about uh, long, big, complex cases which have like six volume and each volume have 250 pages. If uh, Imagine the reality. If I say I will take this case from you and I'll give it to another prosecutor, how long does that new prosecutor needs to read the entire six volumes to understand to start making a list of um, ideas and so on another thing is we have clear messages that uh, uh, many crimes start to be virtual currency and while we complete manually registers um, criminals use crypto money so just to give you more details uh, we have a uh, only one computer which is sometimes not working so we have to submit a request for somebody to come and fix it and then we wait a few days and then they fix it and then it breaks breaks again in two weeks so this is how we work while the criminals are working are uh, using highly sophisticated schemes also I should speak if you give me a few more minutes I would like to say a few words about what happens in the court proceedings when they examine the uh, grand corruption cases. So some cases are now ongoing, espe especially the ones related to high officials. So one case where they're involved more than four or five uh, um, uh, subjects, they are examined between four to six years. After that, they give the sentence, then the, the appeal goes, then they rejudge, then, then again a sentence, and then they go to the Supreme Court. So we have cases from 2006 which are not finished. And what happens with the uh, frozen assets, with the goods? They might be somewhere locked in and losing their value.
Another issue is with the witnesses. What happens with the witnesses? If a person is identified by the prosecutor or by the criminal investigator as a witness, he has the following duties. He must come to be uh, to receive the role as a witness in a court. After that, he comes to the criminal investigation again as a witness. Later, he is heard in the main um, uh, uh, courthouse and if the case is uh, rejudged at the appeal they go to the appeal court and the witnesses stop coming they say that the witnesses move abroad uh, or they work abroad so the judges are forced to reschedule the hearings for when these witnesses come back to the country in vacation so that they can participate in the proceedings so or we can try to do teleconference but if this doesn't work the case is delayed or it's dropped because they know that the witness is not going to fly from Canada again to be part of the court proceedings so in my opinion we need to solve all of these issues that I highlighted earlier at this moment we consider to ensure first of all the technical equipment to hire different expert experts to support the prosecutors during the investigation and to increase the number of prosecutor we also need to have clear competences of the chief prosecutor and i explain why Sometimes I am informed about some um, simple uh, um, uh, wrongdoing regarding one uh, driver's license, right? And when you start uh, uh, going into details, you understand that that is actually a huge scheme which involves many public servants. So I think that at some point the uh, chief anti-corruption prosecutor should decide which cases stay with, the, with his own agency and which one should be passed to other institutions. And again, experts in different sectors. You cannot expect the, the prosecutor to know everything about the banking sector, financial sector and other sectors. And of course, coming back to the investigative office officers and criminal proceedings officers they need to be involved only in their uh, jobs not to be added in other in other activities uh, I actually wrote down 10 of your questions so maybe we only have time for these I have only one question after listening to you which country am I living in am I living in Moldova well you have to extract your conclusions I'm telling you the reality I now I realize how fertile is the soil how ready this reality is for corruption for schemes so if what you are saying is true uh, schemes are very easy to to done you can find the six bodies uh, in different institutions and uh, do your scheme because the situation at the anti-corruption agency is very very precarious yes I'm sorry but it's not only the situation in uh, um, in Chenea, not only in our in, only in our institution but everywhere but I'm wondering if uh, three four people would have been sentenced and imprisoned maybe others would have been uh, discovered well we haven't got there yet okay I understand we'll come back to you thank you so much mr. Montano deputy chief anti-corruption prosecutor absolutely we're gonna come back to you and to this topic I would like to remind you that we are at the forum for justice reform and anti-corruption organized by the legal resources center and the Swedish government it's organized live and broadcasted through zoom and different uh, social networks and uh, we wait for your comments and uh, comments and questions now we go uh, to mr. Artyom Sitnik director of the National Anti-Corruption Bureau of Ukraine who is connecting online mr. Uh, Artyom are you here <laughs> Hello everyone, I hope everybody can hear me. I'm very happy 
to see that in Moldova there's so uh, a complex activity to fight corruption also there was applied a number of reforms to fight corruption and I would like to share my experience that we've accumulated in Ukraine and I would like to share my experience I would like to say that some reforms were successful whilst other were less successful but we continue to fight and to go on this path we created the National Anti-Corruption Bureau and we had several reasons to create this institution obviously the situation was as follows in Ukraine. We could not manage to fight the existing situation and we could not fight corruption. We saw so many obstacles in our path and we decided to create this bureau from scratch which was created to support existing efforts to fight corruption. So this bureau is a specialized body to fight corruption. And when this bureau was created, the situation was very worrying. And we also had partners who helped us in our activity. And I would also like to mention the fact that at that time, it was very important to have this support provided by the development partners from different countries because as you said there were many sophisticated schemes in Ukraine and it was very hard for us to identify them therefore our development partners helped us to unveil these schemes to analyze them and here even I can mention the schemes that were uh, planned by oligarchs. Some of them were part of the political arena, others not. And either way, who was the creator of the scheme existed. They were well rooted and was hard to remove them. So in the National Anti-Corruption Bureau, we recruited a lot of specialists, professionals, who prove that they are capable to be part of this bureau. Also, I would like to say that this body was the first of itself, of this type, created in Ukraine. And it was the institution who was created to fight corruption and to use the most efficient mechanisms and tools in this fight. What is the mandate of this bureau, you might ask? This bureau examines all the criminal cases and the activity is to examine all of these cases and to analyze the cases no matter that to analyze the case no matter the subject if the subject is a politician prosecutor judge and since the creation of this bureau we obtained very good results in our activity first of all this is a one of the kind bureau and the team was created by creating open competition uh, we involved actively the civil society in the discussions and this allowed us to, to this allowed us to find the right team and allowed us to do the investigation in a transparent manner and all the attention was given to examining these complicated cases and in many situations we had to create additional mechanisms needed to increase efficiency of our bureau and we strive to increase transparency of our activity 
uh, and to identify concrete corruption cases within the state institutions. Our team is very good, created from professionals. We do all our best to consolidate our team. And we work very much on different approaches, on the analysis methods. We work on concrete corruption cases. And I can even uh, give an example of a concrete case because I examined the more specific case when somebody wanted to bribe with a uh, big amount and this attempt was uh, cut from the beginning, was caught. We've examined it. We've examined this case multilaterally and we were able to cut it before happening and not only this many attempts were discovered by our bureau and many cases were able to be identified and brought to life cases which happened uh, since the bureau was created we're also speaking about analyzing high level uh, officials in the Ukrainian uh, government, we're talking about members of the government, members of the parliament, and we've identified that they were involved in different corruption uh, schemes. Also, I would like to say that the creation of our bureau and our staff members are independent. They have a status of independent specialists, and this independence has a high role in our activity and in the possibility to analyze the cases and to remove the problems that are identified in the system. We have different uh, departments. We have different connection challenge channels communication channels which allow us to solve the most complex and complicated cases. We also have special departments which help us in the anti-corruption fight. We have very good relations between the departments. We actually complete each other in our activity. We coordinate our activities that we plan and we implement. And in this way, we ensure our colleagues' security. And we do all our best to decrease the risk situations which could occur and could uh, put our uh, staff members in danger. For us, it's very important that people see the results of our activity, not only to hear words, but to see concrete results of our activities and concrete results of our efforts, because we want people to trust us, and people will only trust us when they see the re concrete results. The anti-corruption prosecutor is a separate entity in Ukraine and it's outside of the general prosecutor's office and the general prosecutor does not is not allowed to melt in the activities of the anti-corruption prosecutors he does not have the right to give indications on how to proceed in this or in that case we also have challenges that we face in different circumstances and in different situations. For example, we have a reforming process in Ukraine at the moment, reforming the law enforcement uh, bodies and and from 2006, we've insisted to create specialized institutions so that our entire system works according to the rule of law and in a flexible, flexible manner. This is why the National Anti-Corruption Bureau was created from the beginning when I 
when we had this idea to create this institution from scratch, we had a high, high resistance. Not everybody wanted to see a new anti-corruption institution, but we over we passed these obstacles and in 2016 we created this bureau and uh, I would say thus far we have a successful activity also I would like to say that international experts helped us a lot to create this institution they provided support they provided uh, trust they shared their experience which they accumulated for many years on how to fight corrupt corruption and in the last years we've obtained finally the expected results uh, thanks to our team thanks to our staff members who do their job in this sector There are several cases that were examined in different uh, level of courts of Ukraine and ultimately the cases arrived to the higher to the Supreme Court or constitutional court and the decisions that were taken were correct decisions based on the investigations and evidences that we've collected for them. We also improved uh, many elements in the process of decision making and this also helped. But I would like to stop and speak about some complicated situation that we faced. I would like to mention that the civil society and the citizens of Ukraine expected good results from the very beginning of our activity. And we had to do everything in our power to meet these expectations of the citizens and um, we always acted in conformity with human rights, respecting everybody's freedoms and in good cooperation with uh, other institutions to make sure that people not imprisoned for nothing and that people that are imprisoned as the result of our investigation, they are imprisoned uh, based on legal grounds and based on what we've identified. And also if I can speak about high, high um, theft, and these thefts were related to uh, other corruption acts and different schemes. Well, we've examined many cases where we had a billion of euros being stolen, money which normally should have stayed in the state budget and used for the state interest and not stolen by corrupted uh, of, uh, public servants involved in different schemes. We also uh, analyzed the high-level officials with, uh, which held key positions in state institutions and we've identified that they were part of the schemes. Also, we've identified police officers in part of the schemes and we've managed to curb their activity to stop it and the guilty parties were punished according to the legislation of Ukraine. We've also detained people when, when we had to. And thanks to the steps and measures that were taken even from the beginning of our activity, and with the support of the civil society and citizens, we were able to obtain pretty good results. In April 2022, uh, the mandate of our bureau expires and we will have to change the leader of the bureau. But we consider that our institution must continue to exist must be consolidated so that the activity that we started a few years ago which brought good results thus far must continue we must continue on this path uh, the anti-corruption prosecutor is the one 
which faces several difficulties in this sense. But I think that with common efforts, we're going to manage to reach the ultimate goal to remove the roots of corruption and to do everything in our power to improve the situation of the country. In the, our anti-corruption bureau, we do different types of investigations. We investigate concrete subjects of people who are involved in different corruption cases and they are illicitly enriching their, themselves. And despite all the challenges that we face, I would say that in Ukraine, it was created a strong anti-corruption structure, our bureau, which proved to be efficient in his activity and is capable to go forward and to recoup billions of hryvnas. We already recuperated billion of hryvnas uh, back into the state budget. And of course, we understand we have a lot of work to do to obtain in the future equally good results. Me, I consider that we should not go back to the previous situation when corruption was very uh, present in our country and somehow uh, there was a fight against corruption, but it was just a show. So after the experience of many years, I think that we are very happy to share with our colleagues from Moldova our experience, our methods for the past years, and we are open to have a good cooperation with the Moldovan side. We are here to communicate with our colleagues. We consider that this cooperation is a good one and this will contribute to improving the situation, not only in Ukraine, but also in Moldova. So there are many examples that I can uh, offer to you regarding the activity of uh, members of the previous parliament. There are concrete cases uh, that uh, we are reviewing. We'll continue this. We have um, experience of some anti-corruption um, uh, missions at the international level, uh, which we um, carry out together with our colleagues from various countries. Uh, so, and these uh, cases are focused on uh, corruption. Thank you very much for your attention and I would like to wish you lots of successes. So this was the director of the National Anti-Corruption Bureau of Ukraine. So uh, we have heard these statements uh, uh, many times for the anti-corruption um, authorities of Romania to cross the Prut River and come to us. But now let's uh, virtually cross uh, the Prut River uh, and uh, invite Laura Stefan, uh, expert uh, from Romania. Hello, hello, and thank you very much for this invitation. It is an honor for me to be with you again and to discuss uh, this very important topic. I was very carefully listening to the speeches of my previous speakers. I think they have raised very important issues. And uh, I will try to speak about uh, issues which are important from the perspective of Romanian or even EU experience in terms of uh, fighting grand corruption. The first thing that I would like to mention is that uh, it is already known uh, that in order to fight efficiently grand uh, corruption or organized crime, it is necessary to have specialization, both at individual level and at institutional level. Of course, the Romanian model is different uh, from the model presented uh, uh, by uh, our colleague from Ukraine. 
Romania decided to have one single institution to fight grand corruption. It is uh, uh, a structure that you have uh, uh, mentioned already with the acronym DNA. Uh, it is really trusted now by the population, but in the past the public opinion was different. A first thing that I wanted to say that it is difficult to gain trust, but it's very easy to lose it. And the uh, trust is gained during the years when the institution is working efficiently. What are the um, ingredients of the um, Romanian anti-corruption authority? And I agree with Mr. Munchiano that we can uh, kill an anti-corruption institution if uh, the competencies are too broad, too large, compared to the human and technical resources allocated to that institution. And uh, here I would like to draw your attention to the fact that uh, sometimes the trend is to give too many competencies to the anti-corruption institutions in order to cover all of the aspects that might be of interest for an anti-corruption institution oftentimes forgetting that the resources are not unlimited and offering the possibility for prosecutors for investigators of that institution to be tempted uh, uh, with figures because uh, the institutions are assessed depending on their performances and their performances are reflected best in figures and sometimes they are tempted to have more smaller scales cases files that are investigated quicker and to somehow forget about serious and important investigations that have the potential to fight efficiently grant corruption our national anti-corruption department has a functional independence though it is functioning uh, as part of the um, uh, prosecution the head of the national anti-corruption department has independence in terms of decisions and they also have their own budget it seems insignificant in the grand picture that is uh, analyzed, but without these elements, I think the efficiency of criminal investigation of prosecutors would have been totally different. Also, the National Anti-Corruption Department and Mr. Muntiano we spoke about this in uh, his presentation. The National Anti-Corruption Department has professionals, not all on paper, but within the institution. Uh, it also has police officers, judiciary police officers. A prosecutor uh, can do its own criminal investigation on cases of grand corruption, but it does not mean that um, they work on them themselves. It means that they have more control over the case, but they work together with police officers, and of course they have auxiliary staff uh, uh, assistance. The technical resources are also very important. The anti-corruption department has a technical service uh, since the onset, a technical service that is able to provide support for investigators in terms of uh, um, overhearing the phone conversations, investigation techniques, um, some special investigation techniques. The National Anti-Corruption Department has the capacity and has been done this from the very beginning in a progressive uh, manner, of course, to conduct financial investigations. A lot of discussions have been held with regards to what an efficient sanctioning of grand corruption means. And I believe that it is very important, especially during the current times and in the context of the Republic of Moldova, to discuss about the financial funds leaving the country because of these uh, grand corruption schemes and fraud. Of course, people are interested, and the, the Vox Populi that you have presented is very interesting in this regard. 
People speak about money. More and more people have started to speak about the funds that have to be returned into the state budget. What does it mean? It means first that we have to identify the areas where those resources left for and these um, areas are not necessarily on the territory of the republic of moldova most of the time money has left for abroad so we need international cooperation for that and it's important to find out at an early stage of the criminal investigation uh, what uh, assets can be put under um, uh, seizure and uh, as I'm speaking about seizure I want to say that our and international practice shows that without proper management of seized goods at the end of the proceedings after many years you'll have uh, nothing to sell of course it is worth uh, discussing here what uh, assets can be seized because in many European countries there are serious discussions about this it's useless to uh, put under seizure something the management cost of which are very high and is higher than the money you'll get at the end when you sell those goods also it is necessary to have interinstitutional cooperation to have access to databases to have a unit of uh, financial investigation that would be capable not only of uh, financial investigations but also to be willing to cooperate with the prosecution and with the investigation in order to provide analysis that could be used uh, as part of the proceedings you have spoken also about an interesting practice in the public institutions uh, who, the funds of which are defrauded so you ask them if they have registered a damage and the answer is no we had the same experience in Romania obviously when we speak about frauds of a public budget it is very likely for people that are involved in this fraud to have management position so we somehow ask the wolf if the wolf ate the the sheep and of course the wolf said no that he was a vegetarian and we had cases um, uh, some time ago then on the basis of some documents coming from public institutions courts acquitted uh, persons saying that as long as the public institution does not recognize the damage of course we cannot uh, discuss about a potential crime afterwards the practice of course changed significantly and I believe this was also the result of public pressure the fact that this issue uh, was put on the public agenda and was discussed in the society and now courts this say the same the, the following if you try to recover your damage it's good if not we continue analyzing the case and uh, in the end if we have a condemnation solution and confiscation this money will return to the state budget so maybe here it would be good to have a cross-border discussion to put it like that with uh, colleagues from Romania that uh, had similar problems in the past You've also spoken about access to databases and the reluctancy of some institutions to give you access. Yes, again, we had this problem as well. And I think that we have to uh, start living in the 21st century and we have to understand that the registers of our institutions should, be, should look like documents of our epoch not like some documents from the previous uh, century meaning on paper with signatures and seals court proceedings and how to formulate final decisions i believe it is essential for the court um, proceedings to be open we cannot ask the society to trust our work as long as we are not willing to bring light over those cases and to subject them to judiciary control 
of course, in the case of the Republic of Moldova, I would add a comma, and then I would say that we have to make sure that judges feel independent enough to have a correct review of those cases, meaning without having over there had uh, uh, the constant uh, threatening by Article 307, if I'm not mistaken, the article that speaks about the illegal judgments. Uh, from our experience, such an article does not help solve the problems in the judiciary. And now we're coming to the end. Uh, the convictions, well, well, we have also had the stage when the convictions were suspended. The society was very uh, frustrated because for an ordinary person, um, a con uh, conviction that is suspended equals acquittal. Moreover, uh, these uh, convictions were not accompanied by additional sanctions prohibiting uh, uh, that person to occupy a public position in the future. So even if today, in case of uh, suspended uh, convictions, um, there is a possibility to apply an, uh, pa another sanction in parallel, there are still some discussions in the Romanian society about the best way to fight uh, such uh, sanctions of prohibiting uh, public officials that have uh, a criminal past to occupy public position uh, functions in the future. And uh, we see more and more that um, we focus uh, on confiscation and uh, on a comprehensive uh, tracking of uh, cases from the criminal investigation stage up to the uh, issuance of uh, the uh, final judgment. That's the merit of a young institution recently established in, in Romania, which we call ANABI. And uh, this institution is in charge of tracking the whole uh, path of a case through the uh, judiciary system in terms of uh, uh, seizures and confiscations. One more thing that I would like to add, the immunities. In Romania, we do not have immunity for other categories of um, persons except for members of parliament in terms of uh, detention, arrest, and perquisition, and ministers in terms of um, starting a criminal investigation. We have been criticized many times uh, regarding the lack of objective criteria for uh, cases when uh, the immunity of some people are withdrawn, whereas the immunity of others are not, especially uh, when we speak about ministers uh, who are often defended in the parliament by their colleagues and that cannot be subjected to a criminal investigation only um, unless they uh, end their mandate. So after they end their mandate, a criminal investigation can be started. So um, I believe that we are still living this story. Uh, nothing has ended yet. We are still uh, on this journey. And um, my final um, statement will be about managing the expectations. Mr. Sitnik has mentioned the importance of properly managing the expectations. I believe it is very important for each of us to use the opportunity that we have to speak publicly about the need to understand that the judiciary proceedings last. Nothing happens overnight and it wouldn't be healthy to have uh, uh, brief and quick acts of justice. It is important to comply with the procedures. Of course, it does not mean that an investigation should be analyzed by the court for 15 years. We have seen such exaggerations by Romanian judges, as we've seen in the Republic of Moldova as well. Uh, cases that are transferred from one court to another because no one wants to review it. Reasonability, firmness in fighting grand corruption. 
and also it's important to explain clearly the procedural steps and to comply with all of the um, safeguards for the parties involved. Thank you very much, um, Laura Stefan, a well-known anti-corruption expert in Romania, but not only in Romania. So thank you for this um, speech um, made at um, our justice and anti-corruption forum organized by uh, the Legal Resources Center from Moldova, together with the Moldovan government and the Swedish embassy to Kishino. Those that are watching us online, please be patient. Uh, we have noticed your questions. They will be addressed uh, at a Q&A session. But because uh, Mr. Ion Muntiano wanted to end his intervention, before I give the floor to the other two panel speakers, please um, make the clarification that you wanted to make. Thank you very much. Well, actually, I wanted to finish my ideas uh, in terms of aspects that we believe will bring value added to the anti-corruption uh, prosecution and the process of investigating the grand corruption, the implementation of appropriate social measures so that the uh, prosecution position becomes uh, attractive because we have former prosecutors who are lawyers now. And during some private discussions, we see the other other part of the game and sometimes we are wondering whether it's worth continuing our work as a prosecutors or not uh, and also if there is a possibility to obtain uh, authorities uh, remotely this would facilitate the work of prosecutors very much urgent procedures uh, for some types of files and complaints. I don't know if it's the case but I will open the grace uh, 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 a challenge is reviewed at the Court of Appeal. They uh, need five minutes uh, to speak in the court. Uh, but you have to stay two or three hours in a queue until you have the chance to present uh, your uh, opinion for two minutes. And I don't see any problems why we can't send our statements in writing so that they are read in court. Implementation of modern technologies in our work, I have explained this already. We have signals that um, crypto money is used in corruption cases and in frauds, and we cannot uh, install elementary software on our computers. Proper implementation of the law on specialized prosecution office. The expert has um, explained this special investigation activities, special funds for special measures, uh, special funds for money that it was stolen. So the law on specialized prosecution should be enforced if we want to have some outcomes and if we want to start investigating the grand corruption. Implement uh, software and information systems that would allow analyzing data to establish the connections between the investigated persons uh, and the money spent. Now we will use the analytical center of the anti-corruption center. We don't have this money. So uh, when we listen to some phone discussions, we do this and make notes with a pen on paper. We don't have proper databases. We don't have proper uh, software for that, though I'm sure they exist. Also, uh, in the speeches in the first part of the day, I've heard, uh, and I think this is a good um, idea uh, to limit the cash transactions so that uh, the actual value of money of assets uh, to be identified for example when we do some uh, searches we know that the value of the asset is different from one stated in the declaration but we have no way to prove it so that would be the measures Thank you, thank you very much. And we also have a Q&A session and we will return to you and we will address a part of these aspects that you have underlined. Uh, we have uh, two other panel speakers. The journalist investigations are at high demand now and we believe that they are useful for the law enforcement institutions in the country and if they have a more serious attitude towards the work of our journalists, fellow journalists, I believe this would be a real help 
to bring the perpetrators in front of the judge and have them punished quicker than you are telling to us that it's possible to be done now. Yuona Prashka is a well-known name in the journalism world. Yuona made investigations. I know that you... Uh, so in Romania she said the investments and he corrected I did not make investments I made investigations okay so how difficult it is to make these investigations and um, if uh, those that have to act on the basis of your investigations do it and do authorities take into account the work of a journalist when they investigate a case Thank you for the question and thank you for the invitation to participate in this event. Of course, in the investigative journalist that I am practicing, I had different situations. I had various situations and different types of relationship with authorities. I used to have a minister of justice who used to say that the journalist investigations cannot be used as a source to investigate a prosecutor, uh, to, uh, as a source for the investigation done by the prosecutor. Or we had cases when we would send requests to the prosecution by email and we were asked to bring them on paper with a hand signature so that they are registered properly. We had different situations and we tried to adjust to all of them because that's uh, the job of a journalist. We have to find an answer quicker sometimes than prosecutors. But... Um, I want to make a summary of what we have done over the past seven years as an investigative journalist. And making this um, overview, I found out that many of the topics that we investigated seven years ago, five years ago, are still topical, unfortunately. And I was very sad to see that uh, no results were obtained. For example, seven years ago, we published some information information about the laundromat. It's an investigation made in cooperation with the journalists from a number of countries. And um, now we are in 2021. We had parliamentary committees focused on this topic, laundromat. But uh, as such, uh, uh, a person to be declared guilty on this case was not we don't have uh, uh, there are some uh, um, discussions that this scheme was managed by Platon other other names were mentioned but what I find is that uh, uh, it's not the guilty for example in the case of Lantromite we cannot blame only the justice sector of Moldova for example in Moldova some investigations were started in 2014 whereas uh, in Russia only in 2016 Latvia through which the money went through that uh, came from Russia to Moldova and went to other parties only in 2016. UK, 2017, 2018. Germany, 2018. Yes, we can blame our authorities, but we can see that the situation in other countries is not always... Uh, so they, they react quicker when their money is involved. But in uh, laundromat, the money came from Russia, uh, transited somehow their country and went to a different country. Or another case of 2015, Plachotnyuk um, leaks. I uh, proved back then the connections of Plachotnyuk with other offshore companies, what businesses uh, they are controlling in the Republic of Moldova. Another investigation of 2018 uh, on the villas of Plachotnyuk in Switzerland, France, Romania, and only now they are discussing in the constitutional courts whether they have the right to uh, seize uh, certain assets of Plachotnyuk. So the whole processes are lasting too long. But we journalists have more freedom in our action compared to prosecutors. So we make this information public to inform people about uh, these schemes. Of course, we would like to see the results immediately. But as it was already mentioned, we have to 
manage the expectations. We are not judges, we are not prosecutors to issue verdicts. We show what is happening in the reality. Back in 2015, when Plachetnyuk uh, Lik's investigation was published, the speaker of that time accused us uh, and threatened to sue us because we manipulated the public opinion and uh, we somehow indicated that he was the one to manage the businesses of Plachetnyuk a special um, TV program uh, was organized uh, on that topic. I participated in that TV show and uh, half time through the show, uh, Kando somehow indirectly recognized uh, the realities and uh, the moderator decided to quickly change the topic of that uh, show. But in three years it was found that uh, he did not violate any laws. Uh, we got an answer from uh, the intelligence service, the prosecution, uh, a small investigation by the the um, uh, integrity authority, but no results were obtained. Another well-known case, Bahamas. It is still discussed very broadly. The investigation was done in 2016 on the eve of the presidential elections. And things have not uh, ended yet. The case is still hot. We could describe other aspects, uh, but we gave all the information back then. This uh, topic also had an uh, interesting continuation. We were harassed in the court by those targeted in the investigation. But eventually, yes, here in Moldova, we lost one case, but uh, uh, we won in the European Court for Human Rights because we managed to prove that what we have described is the reality. We did not manipulate, we did not invent anything uh, in spite of the accusations made by politicians. Another case, maybe with not such a major impact, was uh, an investigation focusing on the amnesty uh, on the occasion of the 25 years of independence. Another amnesty is being prepared now, so maybe we need to have a more detailed investigation, because back then, uh, using the possibility of amnesty, um, judges, prosecutors, pedophiles, uh, pimps uh, were released from prison, uh, their status was changed, they benefited of uh, this amnesia, uh, a deputy general prosecutor was released, uh, many well-known people. And I am afraid that, um, well, we hope that the situation has genuinely changed after 2019 and is still changing, and hopefully such cases will be avoided. Another important case that I think it's relevant to mention is we were the minister the most listened to, I mean, listened to secretly. And uh, as I said, uh, in 2015 it was declared Moldova as a captured state. But when we received access to these audio recordings, we understood that actually Moldova is transforming itself into a mafia state because state institutions were used by a criminal group uh, to monitor the calls of the opposition, of the activists. And we've investigated a small segment of uh, intercepted people. And we have additional cases with Department 5, uh, where a good friend of Plahotniuk was uh, hired, and we noticed how easy it was for people to be recorded, audio, video, to be followed, to be stalked by the state institutions once the desire was there. And uh, we did a, we analyzed that uh, department 
episode 5 and we saw how well the judges, the prosecutors, the officers work so well together when there is a common interest of those uh, oligarchs. Now they don't work like this. There are filters which uh, protect the op uh, activists, the opposition of being intercepted. And we did an investigation. And after invest publishing our investigation, we went home, right? Everybody went home and we were thinking uh, if uh, one person is not going to publish uh, this um, product, this means somebody else will. Because all of us probably are under monitoring by these state institutions. Other uh, um, invest popular investigation was Kremlinovich which had a huge impact last year. And our investigation showed how, how a current president of our country is connected to a structure abroad. And unfortunately, until this moment, there's no open criminal case who investigates or follows this uh, case. Or maybe there is, and it's secret. I don't know. Uh, I really hope that the authorities will take into account this in investigation that we did, and they will take into account this hypothesis because we did identify indirect proof of this connection uh, and we had confidential reports proving the connection of the president with other foreign structure and uh, putting things together proved or showed or directed the fact that our president is dependent on some structures from Moscow and it could not even need to be more structures from Moscow but foreign forces that it's enough for uh, a prosecutor to suspect the independency of the state president. And let's remember that the president was naming the prosecutor. Let's remember that the president is the supreme leaders of the army. So it's a high position. And I think the relevant institution needs to do the right uh, due delegate, due due diligence and uh, i hope that ultimately these reforms that are initiated to be completed and also i hope that what mr prosecutor said that digitalization is important uh, it will help the processes to go faster without the obstacles they face now digitalization will bring a addition uh, tool to fight corruption because oftentimes these uh, these paper-based tools are keeping us behind whilst I don't think that uh, we need to we need to expect more before digitizing the country thank you so much Ivan Prashka uh, once again he's a reporter for Rice Moldova once again dear participants uh, online who watch the forum for corruption anti-corruption and justice we kindly ask you to ask your questions or if you would like to take the floor, please let us know. Now I would like to give the floor to Madam Lilia Ioannitsa, a lawyer from the Center for Analysis and Prevention of Corruption corruption. Her name is well known in the public space in Moldova. So, Madam Ioannitsa, please, you have the floor to say your opinion. Thank you so much. I hope everybody can hear me. Me, I believe it's not the right person to speak the last because I heard so many ideas, so many impressions. Maybe I wanted to say many more things, but other speakers already said it's not worth to repeat it. And me as a uh, active listener, I wrote down some notes uh, to react to some of the um, questions, to react to some allegations, to react to some statements that were uh, said by the previous speakers. Once again, I would like to speak about several aspects regarding sanctioning the corruption acts in the Republic of Moldova. I would like to speak about safety measures. And if we speak about special confiscation and expanded confiscation, I would like to speak about the quality of probatorium presented by the prosecutors to the judge. 
and I would like to speak about the statistics and I think the data is the vulnerable points of the law enforcement system of Moldova uh, even yesterday it played tricks of uh, when the National Anti-Corruption Center was talking about the achievements, their data were contradicting other data. And also, I would like to speak about the human capital. Uh, so, speaking about sanctioning corruption cases, we have several studies that were done in this sector. The latest one was published this year. And it was referring to a analysis of sanctioning policies used used for corruption cases. And the results of this study was that basically the the sanctioning character is used for uh, liber uh, for imprisonment, but the biggest challenge from the criminal law is referring to uh, uh, fees, fines, and the taking away the right to held public office or to have a state-related uh, position. We have to understand that. Uh, white color crimes as it's named in the criminal crime textbooks uh, the cases related to corruption are called white collar these cases are important because these subjects are connected to public institutions and to public funds what we see on the statistics of the sentences that come from different courthouses is the fact that this punishment is applied only to about 30% of the subjects and this is only covering last year. So our judges prove high clemency for subjects coming from the public sector and subjects uh, with corruption acts and when they do give a sentence for deprivation of liberty or deprivation or um, or not allowing them to have a public office they do offer this punishment or sanction but for the minimum possible time and we had an attempt to increase the threshold of uh, removing this kind of people from the public sector. There was a proposal to uh, deprive them for life. Unfortunately, the amendments didn't uh, go, weren't approved. And we don't uh, have any judge that applies the maximum time for not holding a public office or a state uh, position. And in case of co commission, uh, in case of corruption cases, after time the fines paid are much smaller than the bribed received. So this doesn't make, make sense. Let's not forget about that provision that we have. If you pay the fine in 72 hours, you are only required to pay 50% of it. And this is a Kafkaesque situation, I would say. And uh, I have several suggestions to the leadership who is going, who plans to amend the criminal code and its sanctions. I would like to invite you to explore this opportunity and explore the possibility to raise the fine to the level of the bribe received. Uh, another aspect which we heard very often from the prosecutor, and I kindly ask him not to be upset and take it as a personal attack, but I would like to speak about the lawyer of the lawyer and the lawyer of the prosecutor. Uh, we only heard the opinion of the anti-corruption prosecutor side, but we don't hear the other side, the opinion of the judges and lawyers. But I think they wrote something in the chat, maybe. 
and we threw all the rocks or the balls in the field of the judges but we never analyzed their perspective or we never tried to appreciate the quality of decisions and the quality of uh, probatorium the evidences that are presented in the court uh, uh, house and if the sentences are public you can even see what was the arguments for that sentence or not uh, and if to comment on the prosecutor's evidences you not always have access to them and you not always uh, see uh, good quality um, evidences so we have more transparency from the judges in this sense and i looked at the cases half of the cases were written with uh, legal uh, points, job descriptions, and less evidences which proved the guilt of that subject. Okay, this was a few years ago, I have to admit. Maybe the situation has changed. If to speak about the confiscation, I looked about the statistics collected about it and of the judges practice of last year and I noticed that in no sentence there was not included special confiscation or extended confiscation of goods speaking about expanded confiscation this is a measure which was applied extremely rare in Moldova uh, maybe when they're discussing this special confiscation um, I read in the media that in a famous uh, case of an ex-prime minister the decision to confiscate the goods and we are speaking about uh, a high value goods of 2.5 million euros to this day this decision is not executed the goods are not confiscated so we have to ask ourselves okay we have a sentence which includes confiscation of goods but how do we apply this sentence into practice uh, let's talk about the relation between the national anti-corruption center and prosecutor if you ask a independent observer uh, the observer is surprised of the relation between these two and we also have the situation when they are in a continuous competition I don't know why but each of them tries to come up with different indicators for example indicators of identifying crimes and this is not only happening in many law enforcement agencies but also within the general prosecutor and anti-corruption prosecutor and please don't blame me for the, my opinion but I think that the general prosecutor and the anti-corruption pro prosecutor uh, both of them had a strong competition but they forget they actually work for the same final objective and I'm not even talking about uh, this specialized institution I'm talking about other institutions as well for example the National Integrity Agency was submitting different requests to the uh, general prosecutor or anti-corruption prosecutor they were asking questions or requests for a clarification in some cases and there was no reply because they felt they were in competition and at some point the National Integrity Agency went publicly and said that yes we have a problem in cooperation and ultimately the general prosecutor said that yes we do have an issue we have the necessary tools which would allow for a good cooperation between institutions but at the moment we don't have it and if to speak about the first results the anti-corruption agency looks like an abandoned baby at the side of the road uh, and um, they start to cooperate they, it's not longer an abandoned baby but they start to cooperate more and more with the intelligence service um, 
like the Romanian example. Maybe our colleague from Romania can uh, correct me if it's not accurate. And if to speak about uh, investiga investigating the acts of cor corruption within the justice, I have the impression that these uh, investigations happen every uh, um, regularly, like in a cycle. I don't know it's the moon or Mercurius's fault, but uh, they initiate a number of investigations, then they realize they cannot back it with evidences, and then they drop it, and then they start again. And I look at the number of cases for illegal e enrichment, which uh, touch, which you refer to judges and prosecutors as well. And by the way, I think all the investigations done on the illicit enrichment of uh, previous uh, pro head prosecutor of the anti-corruption prosecutor probably is a good model, a good example for all the other prosecutors because in his case the officers used all the possible tools and mechanisms uh, and ultimately they proved that this is possible. The mission impossible became mission possible. And, and uh, this is not uh, stopping them. So we need to have a presumption of uh, uh, a suspicion of uh, illegal uh, enrichment and we need to act. Uh, thank you so much for listening. I can come with additional information later on. Thank you so much, Madam Lydia Ioannita. Once again, she's from the Center of Analysis and Prevention of Corruption. Most likely, Mr. Ion Montano, the anti corruption prosecutor will like to take the floor after you threw some arrows into his court. Yes, I would like to speak about special confiscation and extended confiscation. Special confiscation means to uh, um, retrieve the goods received. For example, if the person received an amount of money, like let's say 100 euros, this is special confiscation. When we speak about criminal cases, identified uh, in um, in in process we have the information about the amount but we cannot take that amount because the amount belongs to the state if we speak about extended confiscation, I would like to brag here a little bit. The first sentence where this type of confiscation happened, it was under my supervision at the Botanica uh, Court. In order to obtain this sentence, you need to prove in court how the person became rich. So when you arrest that person, you need to be able to prove that the goods could not have been obtained through legal means, but only with illegal um, means. So I analyzed a person which was retired, uh, but that person continued to have additional income and uh, with no uh, r rational explanation. So I had to monitor that person to document the income. And then we went to, per uh, to check his uh, home and we found huge amount of money which did not correspond to their to their person's pension. So everything we did, we tracked and we collected as evidence and we proved that this person was systematically obtaining uh, illicit means. But not in all the cases where we have corruption case, we cannot apply this uh, method and we cannot prove a confiscated, extended confiscation. He has a hundred euros somebody bribed him with a hundred euros one time we cannot prove systemic uh, corruption with regards to uh, not allowing these people to have public positions and you said some statistics I'm guessing that those statistics included sentences for individuals not uh, public servants we're talking about uh, active corruption and traffic of influence and in this case we can only uh, we can only limit the future 
public uh, position in case of legal entities and the statistics is done for individuals I cannot tell you now the number of the subjects that were sentenced in 2020, but I can assure you that our prosecutor uh, office uh, does maximum diligence to uh, investigate all the public uh, entities and to prove these corruption cases. For example, if they corrupt other public servant, I can go according to the general rule. You cannot be condemned while being a public servant. Uh, if to speak about the sanctioning or the fine equal, being equally to the bribe, I think many people would be happy with this uh, uh, rule. We have many cases of active corruption, right? Uh, we have this example of the police officers which stop different drivers and ask for uh, bribes to not give them a uh, penalty. And do you know what is the sanction for this crime? Up to six years of imprisonment with 200,000 lei. Uh, do you think that they would be happy to pay that uh, bribe or that uh, fine? And the same police officer, if he is caught with that bribe, then he is in danger of uh, imprisonment. So we did many requests to amend the legislation. And until now, we arrived to the Constitutional Court to help amend the legislation. So we have a simple situation when a uh, person from the village is stopped by the road police. Uh, and the guy, the driver, is proposing a bribe, and you can, and the police officer is, the police officer needs to apply a fine of 50 euros. You can understand how much that 50 euro um, uh, fine is, is for that person from the village. So it's a way too big fine for the driver. Again, to speak about the quality of the probatorium, I would like to say that the quality of the evidences is equally proportional to the quality of the working conditions offered by the state for the investigation process. There are many cases, there are many, there, there's a huge volume of work. And, um, um, it's very hard to prove the guilt. Yes, these laws are available everywhere, but not everybody has the time to go into the essence of these uh, uh, points uh, and essence of these arguments. And my last point is the fact that in 2019 and 2020, I had the same position. And I can say that the situation was not very different. Basically, we had the same discussion and accusations. Uh, Anti-corruption prosecutor is only dealing with small corruption and it's not doing anything. Let's look at the solutions. We have specialized the uh, one department to deal with high level corruption. And then they, uh, we, we sent the high level corruption to that department. And we sent there a number of prosecutors. We removed other files, other cases from them so that they can focus on those high-level corruption cases. So in 2020, I left the anti-corruption prosecutor's office, and now I came back and I found the following situation. That department does not have the, any prosecutors. They don't have only high-level corruption cases. It's a whole chaos. They went back to the level, to the principle of quantity. And what they do, they install a uh, video camera 
uh, in different state institutions they film the public servants for two months and then they uh, initiate a case because they want to have a higher number of anti-corruption cases but my, in your opinion this uh, anti-corruption prosecutor delivered some results in my opinion this institution needs to receive additional support to do their job the anti-corruption prosecutor must decide which file which case to take and which not you start with a simple uh, traffic of influence and you analyze that case and you understand that it's a huge schema with huge bribes and you need to reprioritize okay but i see that the political case it's very upset with the uh, nac national anti-corruption center what do you think does it need to be reformed well, I've tried to explain how things uh, are going in our center and, and in the anti-corruption prosecutor, but the anti-corruption prosecution and anti-corruption center, why do they have such a bad relation? I wouldn't say that it's a bad relation. I would say that they cooperate on some aspects, on another aspects they don't cooperate, in some aspects they do agree with the evidences, etc., etc. In my vision, the problem was the fact that they focused a lot on quantity. They focused on investigating hundreds of public servants so that they can prove that they are working whilst focusing, whilst they could have focused on like 10 people, high level people, to prove a high level corruption case. How is it better to um, send uh, 10 people to court or to send a hundred people to court and it's not the fact that the judges don't want to work with those many cases but the high volume of work doesn't ensure quality okay I understand we have somebody from the online to ask a question because we did encourage our audience to ask questions because we're talking about justice reform and anti-corruption and we want to hear from different people person. Mr. Osoyano, you have the floor. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to participate online to this important forum, important for our society. My question is the following. What is the proposal from the anti-corruption prosecutor and what reserves he has in using efficiently the external vetting for criminal prosecutors because prosecutors say that this external vetting stops them or, or it's an obstacle to investigate correctly the corruption cases uh, but I'm thinking in another way in order to apply does this stop them to apply the law or do we need to amend the legal framework to provide additional provisions but ultimately the external vetting does not do anything else than help the defendant and and it reduces the chances to success so this is about judicial control and I would like to hear your opinion thank you so much for your question I would like to ask Mr. Montano so the problem is not about the judicial control of the judiciary uh, procedure uh, the problem is that uh, some people misuse this type of control so uh, is, we don't have a problem for our action to be analyzed by the investigative judge but uh, this power should not be misused uh, and to delay cases by months or years we have a criminal case uh, when the ordinance issued by a prosecutor was challenged 
So oh, the short answer is that we don't have a, a problem with that. We uh, agree for our acts to be controlled as part of a judicial control, but maybe to have a simplified procedure or to have the possibility to review remotely. Look how many people are with us uh, via Zoom. Why should the prosecutor go there? Uh, and spent a lot of time to review uh, uh, a case that is well justified. Sometimes we recognize our error, but sometimes it is misused. I have criminal cases that is formed of groups of uh, prosecutors, and one of the prosecutor has the obligation to go to the court when the uh, complaints are reviewed against the, uh, the prosecution. So that's one person, one prosecutor dealing only with that. Another thing, um, I was discussing with a foreign expert, I don't remember exactly the country, and the lady looked at me and said, look, prosecutor, but why are you doing the investigation? I said, okay, then that's uh, a good question. Why do we have to do these investigations if everything is challenged in the court? So. Again, I disagree. Uh, I don't disagree with the fact that our um, documents uh, uh, to have the possibility to be challenged, but again, it should not be misused. So there is a high interest for these uh, discussions. Mrs. Orlov Maria is addressing the same issue uh, uh, as raised by Mr. Monteanu, mentioning the quality of law that is regulating the legal regime of public property and uh, public services. And her question is the following. The anti-corruption and anti-economic uh, uh, crimes bodies, have they made some initiatives to adjust the law uh, in this area with the European law in order to have um, the possibility to achieve the expected results? Let me explain how uh, a scheme takes place to take over a public land. The situation is the following. A certain uh, businessman appears you can't call him uh, with a different word. So send uh, um, request uh, to lease a land, uh, a plot of land in Chisinau. So we have the same situation. Either the mayor's or municipal council accepts the application for review and reviews it in a collegiate uh, way, sends uh, the land for lease in order to build uh, a building with a social cultural uh, land. So they request to lease a land. So the question is how will you return back uh, the land if in five years uh, the mayor decides not to lease you this land anymore? That's the simple part. We have another less simple part. Sometimes intentionally the mayor's office do not uh, review the application in due time. And uh, that person sends the case to the court and the court does not think a lot. They oblige the mayoralty or the municipal council to lease out the land. And then when you ask the question to the mayor's office, why did you send this uh, agreement? Well, because I have a court judgment. And the same to get uh, the construction permit. The mayor's also, in order to have an explana explanation, sends the case to the court in order to be obliged to allow um, uh, to build that building. So where should I step in? How can I uh, prevent uh, this leasing out? Why this land is not put up for sales at a market price? And can't this be changed? I am a prosecutor. I apply the law. That's the simplest case that we have to deal with. But we have a similar situation in uh, banking law, economic law, customs law, everywhere. Which one should be prioritized? Where should I uh, manage? But Mr. Julian Russo, State Secretary, is listening to your comments, and perhaps the ministry can improve the legal uh, uh, provisions, the law provisions. I understand your hint. I will underline this aspect related to local public authorities. 
Back in 2017, the government decided to simplify significantly the procedure of issuing construction permits. And working back then in a different organization, I presented in details the problems related to that government decision and the legal amendments made as a result of that. And if the central public authority does not respond, does not reply within 20 days since the receipt of the request for a permit, a construction permit, then that permit is regarded as issued. And they uh, reach an agreement. Yes, I want to underline the severity of problem uh, on this uh, topic, topic raised by Mr. Montano. So the permit, the construction permit, is a very complex document which should state whether it is in line with the general urbanistic plan or regional urbanistic plan if it exists meaning uh, the maximum number of uh, stories uh, how many levels of uh, parking lots uh, what connections with public utilities should be in place whether it will not generate traffic jams if uh, the block of flats is too big uh, and there are too many inhabitants so it's a time limit of 20 days. The application is filed. And if uh, within 20 days the mayor's office does not reply, then it is regarded that the construction permit is issued. So this provision was included uh, as a measure to improve the business conditions in the Republic of Moldova. So this is a very specific area of managing uh, uh, and actually, there are cases when uh, the local public authorities might need even up to one year to issue a construction permit because they are very, very complex regarding the amendments to the legal framework. Directly, in relation to this specific case, it should be the Ministry of Infrastructure and Regional Development in charge of this area to make recommendations. Um, of uh, legal uh, amendments, we are open to participate in the development process or to issue our legal opinion when the draft is developed regarding collective accountability. Uh, that's uh, an older practice, and uh, I understand that a solution would be for us to identify individual accountability in the exercise of public or local central authority oh, sorry central or local public authorities because that would ensure clarity for example a special uh, the, the the reporting entity or the person that has to submit the initial report but somehow to individualize the criminal uh, uh, accountability if a crime is committed thank you very much mr Ilan russo if anyone from the room would like to ask something, please uh, ask that question. If you are still thinking, then uh, I will ask uh, the question uh, written by Angela Popil. The Criminal Procedure Code uh, offers to the uh, accusation tools that would allow decreasing the workload, especially when the guilt in committing a crime is obvious. The recognition agreement and the uh, case review procedure, what is the reason why prosecutors do not use this tool? Uh, are you considering to make an inventory of the processes managed by the anti-corruption prosecution and the prosecution office for special cases so that the cases that are beyond the remit of these prosecution offices to be redistributed and when Mr. Montano, I guess, should be the one to answer. Yes, that's true. In the criminal in the criminal uh, proceeding, we have two cases when we can use the fast track uh, procedure. It's the uh, procedure of recognizing the guilt uh, and 
another procedure which in exchange of recognizing the guild and fast track procedure offers some privileges well not privileges but helps to improve the situation in terms of the punishment to be applied to the perpetrator the guilt recognition agreement is not very convenient for the um, uh, guilty person, so it's not applicable. 364 prime is ma mainly used, but 364 prime, I am sure I will generate many discussions here, but I will assume the risk. 364 uh, prime stipulates that evidence should be recognized in the court and many uh, lawyers uh, interpret this not as recognition of evidence, but uh, recognition of guilt. So many of the uh, accused do not want to request a fast track procedure because that they are somehow put in a situation to recognize their guilt. I do not want to start a discussion on this topic because I know that it is interpreted in very different ways and there are different opinions regarding this. In my opinion, as long as the person does not have questions with regards to the evidence and they say, dear prosecutor, dear judge, I agree with these evidence. I don't have anything additional to bring. Please decide yourself. Did I commit an offense, a crime or nothing? Why should I bring all of the um, um, witnesses in the court? Why should I read uh, tons of materials again? Why should I bring the witnesses to confirm one more time what is already in the case file? So that's the situation. I don't know what is happening, but that's the position currently in the court. So, uh, so I, as I told you, I uh, gave this answer, assuming there is to provoke discussions. Thank you very much. You want Prashka had a question uh, from the journalists uh, group. So we journalists are monitoring the activity of uh, prosecutors and we see for example that a criminal case is initiated some people are detained arrested and so on and afterwards nothing happens we make a request and uh, the reply is that the the file is suspended nothing more so my question is the following we investigative journalists we also have the right to operate with personal data. Could we have access to those uh, files that are somehow stored on the shelf? Because a former prosecutor, anti-corruption prosecutor, said that we, at a certain point in time, could have access to these files to read them in our positions of investigative journalists. Cases that are under criminal investigation or suspended because of the failure to identify the person, you cannot have access for sure regarding the um, closed criminal cases. As long as you ensure confidentiality of the documents, okay, and the situation is different. Many files are intersected with others. So for example, it is closed, but it contains data that are important for other criminal investigations. So if we allow uh, uh, access to that case, you can formulate uh, some conclusions about another criminal investigation. So we have to have a decision for each separate case. Normally, only the persons that are targeted by that case, uh, the uh, the uh, but if it's uh, a factual one, uh, if no persons are affected, is, if a fact is investigated, but again, we have to see the specific situation. For example, if there is... Okay, thank you. Mr. Muntano, when uh, we presented the survey, uh, conducted uh, by the um, uh, by the legal resources center from Moldova people said uh, that uh, the anti corruption prosecution is the most corrupted so what could be the level of trust uh, then do you have an internal analysis of of the situation can you answer whether they are corrupt or not how do you get rid of the corrupt ones how can you give them investigate uh, high level cases if they have been involved in uh, things before I do not want to doubt that survey, but I know from my own uh, 
experience, if there is this name, corruption, in the title, then they believe that they are corrupt already. So I've been working with them for more than 10 years already, and it's not correct to say that everybody is corrupt. Nobody is working. But uh, would you admit that there are... Well, like in any public institution, there are some, well, some conflicts of interest. We try uh, within the possibilities of the current law to avoid conflicts of interest. We have uh, a superior hierarchical control. I can check any file that I have some suspicions or we get some notifications from outside that the investigation is not in the correct way. So we keep control. It's not that easy to deviate from the uh, law in the anti-corruption prosecution. But if you are very fr frankly, the fate of a file, does it depend on the prosecutor that investigates it or on the will, will of the head of the anti-corruption? Uh, so we have two parties. So the accused was this uh, person and we have the other party. It can be the affected party. And also, there is a high interest uh, in the files that are being uh, managed by the anti-corruption prosecution. So these cases are somehow visible. Uh, the National Anti-Corruption Center supervises their cases. They uh, monitor the sentences issued. They uh, calculate their own statistical data. Of course, if there is no evidence, uh, then uh, the only possible thing is to close the case. But you cannot close a case which contains evidence. That's a nonsense. But uh, this uh, perception of people that sometimes uh, justice and politics go hand in hand, and oftentimes there are some uh, agreements uh, somewhere behind the curtains that decide the fortune of a case. No, I'm not aware. I've never been involved in such discussions. I have always worked as uh, requested by the criminal procedure code. That's my recommendation to my colleagues. I was never involved in such a case. I am not aware of such uh, situations when politics uh, and politicians interfere directly with the criminal investigation. Is it possible to have a genuine independence of the justice sector? I do not feel any pressures or unlawful uh, uh, um, recommendations made to me. I work in strict um, uh, compliance with the law. So uh, it's not possible. Then what's my purpose there? Am I a typing machine or what? I am doing criminal investigation. I cannot execute any indications. If there are people that want to come and execute investigation, it's their problem. I am doing criminal investigation. I know how many analyses were made by Mr. Julian Russo when he was in the uh, NGO. So I believe he knows very well where we should intervene and why and why um, internally they do not uh, admit that things are not that good. They come up with excuses rather than uh, admitting the situation as it is. The intervention in the justice sector that is promoted by the government, meaning the um, external vetting, is a confirmation of the fact that we cannot continue anymore in the same fashion. And again, without making any uh, hints um, and without uh, associating uh, the situation compared to a representative of an anti-corruption prosecution that is with us here, uh, people have a low perception uh, of uh, justice sector. At the same time, we receive information and more and more information recently that uh, there are some representatives of the prosecution that were involved in dirty things and that cannot justify their wealth. The concrete cases 
are obvious and I think uh, the number will continue to grow and uh, we have the first signs that the system starts to deliver for example the recent actions of the anti-corruption prosecution in cooperation with the um, uh, security and intelligence service shows that it is possible to start criminal cases using the article on um, illegal enrichment. The references from the past, including by investigative journalists and also certain reports that were submitted by the National Integrity Authority, have started to be used now, which is a good thing. Nevertheless, we have to stay vigilant because um, the, ju the justice sector will be really independent when well-designed processes are put in place. I mean internal processes that prevent misuses and these these processes are connected strongly to human beings to the human factor we could uh, slide back uh, to a condition where people uh, misuse those uh, processes and history books tell us that uh, historic opportunities um, are not that often. And the fact that currently we have a certain uh, uh, mix of circumstances should be um, harnessed by us. Yes, we need to be diligent, but at the same time we have to hurry because we do not have too much time available. Mr. Montano, nevertheless, seven years for the case on the theft of the billion. Do you think that seven years is too short of a period? If you compare that we have criminal cases pending on uh, influence pending uh, since 2016, then formulate your own conclusion. I don't know, it's relative. Uh, compared to the workload uh, involved in that case, yes, the expectations are huge, I agree, but I've explained the impediments. These are the real problems that we encounter every day, every hour, every minute when we go to work. So these are situations that are designed, adjusted, so they have been created for years and we need years to dismantle them. But do employees feel now that they have their hands uh, uh, free to investigate and to deliver results? The employees, I don't know how to answer this question. I've already said they are brave enough. They have good intentions. But again, they have to deal with the same problems on a daily basis, regardless of what is happening in the politics, because it is us to deal with our problems. The requirements are very high, but the problems are the same. I believe that we need to have uh, uh, high uh, expectations, but we also have to be provided uh, uh, possibility to act but could you demand that politics that politics help you it is not my duty to do that my duty is to implement the criminal procedure code and the criminal code that's it mr russo I would like to say that we are ready to discuss solutions for the procedural or criminal legislation that would be directly related to the Ministry of Justice. We also have the Ministry of Finance involved and I believe the Ministry of Finance will be open to hear the needs and what should be covered as a matter of priority. Of course, the decision-making process is more complex and it also involves the General Prosecution Office, but it's a process that can be started. And again, what we could do, the Minister of Justice, is to facilitate 
the negotiation of new agreements of cooperation with other countries based on my own experience, a short one, one month and a half, I would like to say that nine countries already have declared their interest to negotiate bilateral agreements that would allow exchange experience, that would allow um, set up a joint um, investigation task force and uh, to facilitate the implementation of seizure orders if uh, this can be issued by our authorities. Not only rogatory commissions to be used as a classical mechanism that is uh, stated in older conventions, but for us to be able to use newer tools as well in order to speed up the criminal investigation and the most important thing to make sure that that the uh, wealth acquired by crime is recovered. We also have uh, confirmations from our, when we have confirmations from our partners, we will invite you to be part of the negotiation group uh, so that we can agree on the areas that are interesting for the anti-corruption prosecution in special and for law enforcement bodies overall. So we would like to give the possibility to enforce the criminal law, including abroad, to identify assets, to confiscate them and bring them back home. I believe this is one of the essential elements of the investigation of the banking fraud. Though seven years have passed, there are still traces. And I believe the biggest problem will be to enforce these judgments and decisions because many assets have been dissipated through offshore areas. If uh, our guests from Bucharest and Kiev are still with us and if they would like to say something, they have this possibility. Uh, we have uh, a question from Ina Petru. I understand that the forum is about fighting corruption, but what are the actions to prevent corruption? Okay, the um, declaration of uh, wealth and interest is a prevention action. If five years ago you would tell to someone that uh, you have the possibility to read uh, the declaration of all public officials and the public dignitaries, I believe most of the people would have been skeptical. Unfortunately, the prevention of corruption at systemic level, or it's also called uh, small-scale corruption, does not generate immediate effects. And again, returning to what I've said from the very beginning, the small-scale corruption is generated by grand corruption, corruption in education, in healthcare, in um, the Ministry of Interior's bodies. Uh, in the, yes, but this is uh, viewed as small-scale corruption. Yes, but it affects a lot the people's perception of corruption because uh, they form an opinion about corruption on the basis of their daily interaction and the incidents they have. So preventing this corruption has a very efficient uh, tool, but which is not available currently. And this is to increase the income for the officials in these sectors, to guarantee a decent living, allows decreasing the risk of small-scale corruption. But to be able to guarantee it, you have to first curb grand corruption, because it limits opportunities, it destroys and erodes the national budget. and. Uh, chases away or makes all the foreign investors leave our country. I do understand that our citizens want to have results today, but our priority should be to fight grand corruption first. And there are some uh, prevention aspects also. For example, uh, the um, expert proofing of some draft laws uh, in order to see whether they are prone to the risk of corruption or not. There are some other tools, uh, but frankly speaking, um, I do not believe uh, 
uh, that we will have results by institutional uh, assessment. We have this mechanism stated in our law for a while already, but it's not functional. Mr. Montiano, would you like to add something? Madam Lilia, you wanted to conclude, to add something, but I remind you that we are on the last uh, uh, minutes. Yes, I would like to speak about the prevention efforts. We, mean, we need to increase the level of wages uh, and to increase the wages of uh, target, uh, targeted groups which are more prone to corruption in terms of uh, health uh, corruption, educational corruption. But this could also be an element which could decrease corruption if these uh, target groups would increase their, their income but i would like to look at the justice sector we've increased their salaries and it was not a solution for the corruption to be decreased in the justice sector i would like to take a step back and to remind you in the first session of today in the first panel the representative from croatia uh, Mr. Dubravica, he said that we, a big focus should be placed on education. I will not, uh, I support this. And I would like to say that we have a huge moral crisis in our society. And we need to improve our communication, we need to improve education, we need to improve awareness raising among the society to promote the idea that it's good to be uh, honest and to have integrity and I think that uh, doing all of this we are going to help our society to be less corrupt I hope I don't sound pathetic but this is my opinion thank you so much for your opinion uh, if you would like to take the floor uh, Mr. Stef Mr. Mr. Yuan, you can take the floor. Thank you so much. I know that there's not much time left, but I would like to uh, uh, mention a very important tool, which is called the Integrity Tests. And this tool is under the Anti-Corruption Center. It's one of their measures to prevent corruption and uh, with some uh, clarification in order to increase the efficiency of this mechanism we should copy the practice of romanian colleagues we should uh, uh, follow the colleagues of dda the anti-corruption department of ministry of internal affairs and they use these integrity tests already for 10 years and i would like to say that they have an exceptional efficiency in, or in preventing corruption Option. When they applied this test, we did an analysis of their results. Uh, they did 904 integrity tests in the police of among police officers, and only 7.4 percent were proven not to be integer. Uh, and uh, more than 90 percent of the police officers uh, tested were proven to be honest and not corrupt. And the success of this mechanism was the following they changed the um, sanctions uh, and we don't have the mechanism to directly apply this sanction if this sanction is done by the leaders and the most serious sanction is firing which unfortunately is not always applied but if we look again at the Romania if a police officer is requesting a bribe or is part of a corruption case they can be criminally prosecuted so when we are speaking about decreasing systemic corruption crime when we are speaking about uh, corruption done by police officers, public servants, pu state workers, uh, we are talking about uh, workers who have the right to give uh, uh, fines to the citizens. This is a very this test is very good for preventing corruption. 
uh, in the rest, I think we only need desire to apply all of these tools. And I think that if we're going to adopt this integrity test, it, we will see the results in six months to one year. This is all. Of course, I can speak about all the other tools. Uh, the verification of assets, verif testing the competences, but I think ultimately, just like Madam Ioannitsa said, we need to have a policy for education and awareness raising, and this policy must be supported with concrete cases of sentencing uh, corrupted uh, individuals, because uh, if you present them the theory, if you present the theory to the society and you show them uh, concrete cases of sentencing, then the message will be loud and clear. Thank you so much, Mr. Yuan, for your intervention. We are um, arriving very close to the end of the second day of the forum. We're waiting for Mr. Gribincha for the cl closing words and the conclusions. I would like to thank all the guests for their speeches, for their opinion, and we come back once again to the fact that the justice sector needs needs very much to build back the trust because if the citizens are going to trust the justice sector, uh, the justice sector can serve the citizens. Thank you so much, dear guests, for being part of today's forum. The Forum for Justice and Anti-Corruption is getting very close to its conclusion. I would like to invite Mr. Vladislav Gribincha, the Director of Legal Resources Center from Moldova, and uh, not before, I thank very much to the Swedish Embassy uh, and the Swedish government who made it possible to organize this forum, and of course, I uh, give the floor to Mr. Vladislav Gribincha. Participants, we are at the end of this forum organized by the Legal Resource Center from Moldova, Moldovan government, and the Swedish uh, uh, embassy in Moldova. We are here with the director of the Legal Resources Center, Mr. Vladislav Gribincha. Mr. Gribincha, what are the first conclusions that you extracted from the second day? Well, yesterday we spoke about many elements about the vetting. 
Uh, in the second day, I would like to highlight the notes that I wrote down from the speakers and ultimately I will come with my conclusions. And this, uh, I would like to mention that on the YouTube account of our legal center, we are going to broadcast the video registration, video recording of both days of forum. But I would like to give you the conclusions uh, of both days. Madam Stamati, we're speaking about the vision for combating corruption. And she said that the political arena is going very fast with the reforms because this responds to the expectations of the citizens and their objective is to uh, real uh, to really reform the justice sector and according to madam stamate the political arena must be the first to provide an example of good behavior of integer behavior and she said that the current government will be a uh, example at the same time, she mentioned that many problems that were highlighted were related to discretion of the judges, which needs to be limited by law. Mr. Robo, at the interim general prosecutor, said that people that uh, uh, became rich illegally must be sanctioned. He also said that uh, the rights of the accusers must be re uh, backed by the law. And he said that in the latest time, once more sensitive case started to occur, more fights of the prosecutor started to occur. The ex-general prosecutor of Ukraine, Mr. Ruslan Ryabushapka, highlighted several things. He said that Moldova is in a much better political position than Ukraine in order to implement justice reform. Form. Still, citizens have uh, high expectations and the changes, even though they need to happen very fast, they will not be felt by the citizens in a uh, short term. This is why the expectations must be managed. It's important, he says, to find champions for change, to find a few hundreds of Spartans which would accept to fight for justice. People that have a high verticality, honest people and high professionals. This, he said, was the biggest challenge for Ukraine. And even Ukraine has a higher population than Moldova. Even for them, it was hard to find these 300 Spartans. And he also mentioned that probably the shortest solution for countries with a high level of corruption would be resetting the institutions, if this is possible. And he gave the example of the anti corruption bureau from Ukraine and how this institution was created from scratch at the same time he mentioned that there must be verified leaders of the general prosecutor's office and any other institutions. And he gave the example of Ukraine where 50% of the prosecutors were fired after being vetted. Mr. Lanningen from INL, from US Embassy to Moldova, he mentioned that fighting for uh, against corruption is a priority of the US government. And it was recently reiterated by Biden president. Fighting corruption, uh, this fight cannot be stopped. It's a constant fight for important values because no uh, reform is irreversible. And the example of Romania felt like uh, relevant examples a couple of years ago. Uh, and he mentioned that the life of corrupted individuals must be very difficult, must become very difficult in order to discourage uh, corruption and new corruption cases. He also mentioned that the legislation of Moldova is not a bad one, but at the implementation, it's not going so well. So we have a good legislation which did not give the expected results until now. He also 
repeated how important it is to focus on the people working in these uh, anti-corruption uh, centers and the justice sector. Mr. Dobravica from Croatia mentioned that there were many reforms in Croatia to combat corruption, but they did not uh, they did not uh, focus on the political uh, desire, but they focused on the EU conditionality in order to become an EU member state. So it was one of the conditions of EU, which is it's something that Moldova doesn't have at the moment. He also said that the people from the system will be hesitant at the beginning because after much stagnation, they will not want to jeopardize their career current situation and career. Also, Mr. Dubravica said that we should not count on a rapid change of public opinion and perception of the phenomenon of corruption. This will take a long time and this needs to be taken into account by the politician in order to avoid the, um, um, in order to avoid um, disappointment. He also spoke about the small corruption. He spoke a little bit about external vetting, saying that this can bring some results, but the success it's not guaranteed, and this procedure can uh, in can put in jeopardy the justice uh, process. It's important for the justice sector to go hand in hand with improvement in the educational sector and raising the living condition. And it's important for the civil society and independent press to be the ones involved in the reforms because they were the main supporters of combating corruption. Me, I also mentioned the six priorities that could be used by any government in order to efficiently combat corruption. We are speaking about limiting the discretion of public uh, servants uh, when it, uh, it's time for them to work for the state, increasing transparency, uh, see tough sanctions for corruption cases, uh, efficient institutions who can investigate this corrupt in corruption ca cases based on good legislation, social guarantees for public servants so that they are connected to their job and they don't uh, accept the appeal of corruption, a uh, judicial sector which gives uh, good and fair equitable decisions in the corruption case, and a investigative press who does their job, and a vibrant civil society which could uh, support these reforms uh, as well. I also mentioned, and I will repeat myself now, that the leadership, the government, uh, uh, by leading by example, is one of the most important ways to combat corruption. I know that this is not easy because after many years uh, of um, institutional changes, few people believe in the leadership, but this is useful to be done. Also, I would like to re reiterate that the involvement of experts and civil society in identifying those uh, champions for change is critical for countries countries like ours. This was the first panel of discussion conducted in the morning. And now let's list, let's uh, look through the conclusions of the second panel of discussions, which focused on investigation and sanctioning the grand corruption. We had Mr. U Igor Russo, who mentioned that it's very important to focus on confiscation of goods which cannot be justified. He also mentioned that we we in the Republic of Moldova, we need in we need in anti-corruption prosecution honest and high professional individuals, and they also need more resources uh, in order to do efficiently their job. At the same time, he mentioned that there is a serious problem with integrity among the national anti-corruption center. 
And he also said that they, the criminal code needs to be evaluated in order to punish or sanction appropriately the corruption uh, cases. And I was happy to listen to this. I was happy to hear potentially this uh, uh, idea coming back to the agenda of the institutions because this was long term a uh, such a recommendation for the government. Igor Montano, the deputy chief anti-corruption prosecutor, Yiwon Montano, I apologize, I called him Igor. Uh, he mentioned the challenges that he faces, and not only him, but uh, anti-corruption prosecutors. He mentioned a long list of problems, and he also mentioned some of the solutions. He did not uh, speak about the integrity of prosecutors. I somewhat understand why, but he said that anti-corruption prosecutor need more technical equipment, uh, which they are missing now. They need a higher number of anti-corruption prosecutors. They need a chief, the chief anti-corruption prosecutor needs to have the competence to select the cases to take and to focus on them so that they select only grand corruption cases. And then he said that many experts or investigation officers left because the salaries, the wages are pretty low. Another issue is the digitalization and examination of requests. He said that maybe it would be good to have uh, to for the judges to accept electronic versions of the documents. He also spoke about access to database where they could check several transactions and economic activities. Activities. I know that there is such a database in the prosecutor, and I was surprised to find out that it's not being used. Mr. Sitnik, director of National Anti-Corruption Bureau of Ukraine, he spoke about the successes registered in the six and a half years uh, of this bureau that he is leading. He also mentioned how important it is to have uh, at the head of this institution honest individual and individuals which can deliver a result. He uh, went through a competition and uh, with other more than 150 candidates and he was selected as the chief, the director in 2015. And as far as I know, the process was not, uh, was deemed uh, uh, fair and uh, somebody tried to bribe them with five million uh, uh, dollars and this attempt of bribing was reported and as far as I know none of uh, his colleagues uh, ever left their position because they are doing a good job there was never an uh, investigation on them he also shared uh, his experience and he shared crucial step about his activity in the past six years and I think we can learn about it not only um, ideas for improving the legislation but on how to internally function. Madam Laura Stefan from Romania highlighted the fact that in case of investigating the corruption cases, we need to train the prosecutor and they need to be specialized so that they make these cases as high quality as possible and not focus on the number of cases, but on the quality. Uh, she mentioned that uh, DNA in Romania has, uh, uh, e has full independence and the head of this institution has full uh, discretion over the budget and activities and cases. It not, and it's not like a Moldova where the budget of the anti-corruption uh, uh, agency is uh, uh, limited and controlled. She also mentioned that Denia has their own specialist uh, uh, and equipment in order to do all the investigation, like uh, intercepting different uh, conversation and so on. And the judicial uh, processes should be open 
in order to and should communicate in order to prove that fighting corruption is not happening only on paper but things are happening in reality and sentencing and she said that at the beginning uh, the sentences were not very high were not very strong but with pressure from the civil society uh, the next sentences were much more tough because at the beginning the judges were tempted to give only uh, easier sentencing so the more the civil society was reacting the harsher the sentencing were this means that the involvement is important if uh, and the Romanian judges uh, changed their practice and now they give uh, sanctions according to the uh, illegal facts that were committed. She also mentioned that besides the sanctions, uh, interdictions, uh, another focus is to um, confiscate the illegally obtained goods. And she mentioned that uh, it's important once again to calibrate the expectations and to inform the public that r justice reforms are mean a long-term process and uh, not always the expectations of the citizens are met. And Madam Ioannitsa mentioned uh, several things which I would like to repeat. She mentioned that it's important to clarify uh, the regulations, the provisions regarding sanctions for, according to the gravity of corruption uh, case because there is some discrepancy for sanctions for, for some small cases whilst other serious corruption cases uh, have uh, lighter sanctions. And she also mentioned that there is seems to be a competition between the anti-corruption prosecutors and regular prosecutors and this competition should be excluded and cooperation should be encouraged this is what i wrote down during the two panels i'm certain that many other things i didn't uh, uh, write down this is why i encourage you to watch the recording of our forum on our youtube page uh, thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Gribinch, I'm thinking after two days of uh, hot debates, I don't know if I uh, agree with the government is that uh, the priority number one should be combating corruption. And uh, I heard, from what I've heard, I understand it's not an easy task. They have many obstacles in order to deliver good results. So maybe the uh, political arena should intervene, the government should intervene to amend the legislation to help the anti-corruption prosecutor. Or do you think we have enough laws and we need to work on the implementation? Because as we know, the law and application of the law don't always go hand in hand. And we need both of them to go hand in hand to bring results. Uh, I would like to ask you, are you content did uh, did you meet your expectations of this forum yes the our objective was to have an open discussion between the government uh, civil society press and development partners and to highlight the challenges which join such reforms either in moldova or in uh, different countries Thank you. Yesterday, the members of the parliament fired Mr. Flocha, the head of uh, anti-corruption center. And I come back to the, dis to the statement of the previous uh, general prosecutor Stoyanoglu, who accused the current government, that they are trying to gather all power in their hands. Do you, can you reply to Mr. Stoyanoglu? Well, I'm not the best suited person to reply to Mr. Stoyanoglu's 
comments. Yesterday, I didn't watch the news. I was at the forum, but I uh, mentioned something at the opening. The essence of these reforms will reduce to fighting for people's hearts. People who can believe in the changes and that the fact that these changes are not done in order to control these institutions, but the changes are done in order to change for the better the situation in the justice sector. And these changes are done so that truth and justice wins in any circumstance, in any courthouse, in any situation. Okay, thank you so much. And I would like to believe that this bad reputation of Moldova, this idea that Moldova is corrupted, could change in a relative short period of time, especially since uh, the citizens want to get rid of uh, corruption. Uh, it was not um, very mentioned, uh, the political corruption and me I believe in the political will of the current government and I expect them to achieve results especially in this sector which is not easy to reform but at the same time it's not impossible we do expect for results uh, here we close the forum for justice and anti-corruption mr. Gribincha you have the closing words well thank you as a conclusion I can kindly ask you to watch the video recording of this uh, two days forum. I can assure you it will be interesting. You will gather interesting ideas, interesting remarks, solutions. You will hear a lot of good substance. Uh, we had very good discussions and we from the legal resources center from moldova we are going to support the authorities to do the best reforms needed in the republic of moldova i said it before and i will say it again as long as we see a real intention to change uh, things for the better we the legal resources center are here to help and we had the same reaction towards any government and institution that we had in Moldova. At the same time, we are going to continue to monitor the situation, and I can ensure you that we will do this in a impartial matter, manner, and we're going to publish our opinion just like we did with previous governments. Uh, we will do the same with the current government. If we see infringements, we are going to speak out. And I think that but uh, the best thing you can do to help somebody is to let them know when they do a mistake. So we will do this uh, procedure. That being said, I would like to thank you very much, Madam Ursu, for your moderation that you provided. I would like to say that for the next year, we will have another forum. We have very high standards and we cannot uh, um, drop them, we will organize another forum, maybe in spring. Why? Because I think that after these movements, uh, things will change and maybe the changes will lead to significant uh, packages adopted. And I don't doubt the fact that the current government has the right intentions and I wish that they can learn from the other countries' mistakes. Thank you so much, Mr. Gribincha. We are closing the Forum for Justice and Anti-Corruption organized by the Moldovan government together with the Legal Resources Center and the Swedish government. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a nice day.